Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 12994 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. Could I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please, and I call on Michael Matheson to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 14 minutes or so. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm happy to open this stage one debate on the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. I'd like to begin by thanking my, colleagues, uh, my colleague and predecessor, Kenny McCaskill, who brought forward this uh, bill last year. I'd also like to thank the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their work in considering this bill. I was pleased to note uh, from their report that the Local Government and Regeneration Committee supports the general principles of the bill, in particular the licensing of air weapons. I'm grateful to the committee for the manner in which they took evidence at stage, two, stage one on this bill. They invited a wide range of stakeholders to give evidence and did this in the spirit of drawing out those changes that will, in line with the aims of the bill, best improve the relevant licensing regime in Scotland. The evidence and the committee's report have been extremely valuable in helping the government to reflect on whether uh, we can make further improvements to these particular areas. Uh, the committee will have now seen my response to their report. I'm pleased to uh, be able to now update the wider parliament uh, by providing an overview of the bill. Uh, the bill comes in four parts. Part one, uh, the air weapons section, it sets out a new licensing regime for air weapons administered by Police Scotland. Part two, it covers alcohol licensing, amends the existing licensing regime for alcohol licensing, including uh, included within uh, the licensing the Licence uh, Scotland Act uh, 2005. Part three, uh, civic licensing, amends the existing licensing regime included within the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982. And lastly, part four, uh, which sets out our general provisions. Looking first at air weapons, the licensing of air weapons has been on our agenda for quite some time. Our 2007 manifesto set out plans to tackle this. We reiterated this in, as an aim in our 2011 manifesto and following the report of the Calming Commission in 2009, responsibility for the regulation of most air weapons was devolved in the Scotland Act 2012. Kenny McCaskill introduced the bill, having chaired a firearms consultative panel of experts and carrying out a wider consultation on the principles of licensing. The aim has been to set out a regime which parallels the existing firearms legislation where appropriate, and so is familiar to the police and to shooters, but is relatively light touch in its practical application. The Local Government and Regeneration Committee suggested a few amendments in their Stage 1 report. I have already responded to those recommendations, but I would like to mention a couple of the most prominent issues at this particular point. The first is in relation to Police Scotland and the need to smooth the transition workload for, uh, the, for the work which will be undertaken uh, by Police Scotland for the introduction of the licensing. Officials are still discussing this with uh, the police to ensure that the impact of the new regime is minimised as far as possible. We are considering whether this is best achieved by way of an amendment at stage two or through regulation under the bill. The second issue is the proposal to add some forms of identifier mark to air weapons to support the, cert the certificate system. The Scottish Firearms Consultative Panel agreed at a very early stage that it would be appropriate to licence a person rather than the gun itself. Continuing discussions with stakeholders, including Police Scotland and the Gun Trade Association, confirm that there is little or no support for a proposal to mark weapons individually. This would place immense additional burdens on the police, 
the trade and shooters, but do little to help tackle criminal misuse of air weapons. I therefore do not intend to bring forward amendments to introduce an identifier mark at stage two. Turning from air weapons, uh, we uh, should also consider the areas around alcohol licensing provided within the bill. Consultation has made clear that people do not want to see a root and branch review of alcohol licensing legislation. However, there are areas that are, working, uh, are, that are not working as effectively as they should be. Therefore, rather than propose any radical overhaul of the regime, the Bill looks at these areas to find ways to improve the existing system. For example, taking forward a commitment made in the 2011 SNP manifesto, the Bill will create new offences of giving or making available alcohol to a child or young person for consumption in a public place. This will allow Police Scotland to address the problem of drinking dens where vulnerable young people can congregate to share alcohol. The Bill introduces a fit and proper test that for both the premise and personal licence applications and licensing boards will also be able to consider spent offences. These changes have been widely called for and will assist licensing boards in ensuring that only those who are fully appropriate can hold such a licence. In terms of licensing board practice, we are clarifying that an overprovision assessment can relate to an entire board area and can take account of licensing hours. We have also considered statements of licensing policy. There is some very good practice at board level, but licensing policy statements are often failing to have the strategic impact that we would hope that they would provide. We are therefore amending policy statements to better align with local government elections. This will encourage a new board to take stock, gather evidence and set a policy statement that reflects their own views and aspirations. There are also a number of fairly technical amendments, for example, uh, amending the final licensing objective to include young people alongside children. The distinction between children and young persons can create difficulty for licensing boards when they are dealing with issues around young persons and can have the effect that issues around 16 and 17 year olds cannot be considered in relation to protecting children objective. This amendment uh, is to make sure that licensing uh, boards have the power to be able to consider this as part of their licensing objectives. There are also a number of provisions that should be welcomed by the trade. For example, removing the five-year ban on reapplying for failure to render a personal licence refresher training certificate and imposing a duty on boards to report on their income and expenditure. The Bill also improves the effectiveness of civic licensing regimes with a variety of reforms across a wide range of areas. For example, the Bill will ensure the tightening up of the licensing of metal dealers to ensure more effective regulation of the industry and to make it more difficult for metal theft to be disposed of, uh, uh, to be disposed of by uh, which has been stolen. It will deliver this by ensuring all dealers are licensed, banning the use of cash for a payment of scrap, tightening record-keeping arrangements and requiring proper identification of customers. The Bill will also allow communities a greater say over whether lap dancing takes place in their area by allowing local licensing authorities the power to control the number of licences for sexual entertainment venues in particular localities. Central to this proposal is the belief that local communities should be able to exercise appropriate control and regulate sexual entertainment venues that operate within their area. Local licensing authorities are best placed to reflect the views of the communities they serve and determine whether sexual entertainment establishments should be authorised and under what conditions. The Bill also simplifies licensing of theatres 
by merging the theatre licence with the public entertainment licence regime. This will allow some theatres that currently have two licences to now operate with a single licence. Additionally, the new licensing regime is more flexible, replacing mandatory licensing with a discretionary scheme that allows local licensing authority authorities to exempt smaller theatres if they so choose. The Bill also aims to bring greater consistency between and within taxi and private car hire licensing regimes. Local authorities are responsible for the taxi and private hire car licensing regimes. They have discretion in applying a local regime that best meets the specific requirements of their local area and can take account of the views of both customers and trade. In general, this local process works well. However, we are aware that there have been a number of concerns with the taxi and private hire car licensing regime for some time. These have been highlighted by stakeholders during informal discussion and were further reinforced during the public consultation exercise. Specific provisions in the Bill include the power to refuse to grant private hire car licences on grounds of over-provision. The extension of driver testing to allow testing of private hire car drivers and the removal of the contract exemption to the licensing and regulation of taxis and private hire car, bringing hire car used, used into uh, the, contract, in the contract regime. These provisions in part acknowledge that in part of the country, taxis, private hire cars and contract hire cars are essentially operating in a very similar market. Some of the uh, distinctions between their modes of operation, for example, pre-booked versus rank and hailing, have been blurred with changes in technology. In addition to the amendments to uh, specific regimes within the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982, there are additional provisions that will have effect across licensing parts of the 1982 Act and aim to create greater consistency and clarity to the licensing regime. The Bill includes a number of provisions aimed at improving the operation of all Civic Government licensing regimes and clarify compliance with the EU Services Directive. Specific provisions include power for Scottish Ministers to make provision for the procedure to be followed at or in connection with hearings. The Bill also introduces a new role, Civic Licensing Standards Officer, with broadly the same powers and duties as an authorised officer within the 1982 Act, but with specific functions in relation to providing information and guidance, checking compliance, providing mediation and taking appropriate action on perceived breaches of conditions to a licence provided under the 1982 Act. Officer, I have set out the Government's thinking on some of the key areas of what is a wide-ranging bill. I look forward to hearing uh, the views of colleagues through the course of this debate and to working with the Committee as we continue with the passage of this bill, this bill through Parliament. And I therefore move that Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. Many thanks, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Kevin Stewart to speak on behalf of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Convener, around 10 minutes or so. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and it is uh, my pleasure uh, to speak in today's debate on behalf of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. The Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill is an important and necessary piece of legislation. Uh, before I embark on the core of our deliberations, I want to take a moment to set out the key role licensing plays in Scotland today. Licensing assists in preserving public order and safety, reducing crime and advancing public health. Uh, I will return to these themes later in my speech as these objectives were the backdrop to our scrutiny and are fundamental to the recommendations that we have made in our report. While recognising the importance of these objectives, few of us actively consider the relevance of licensing to our daily lives. 
But for those we spoke to, it's about their livelihoods, the services they use, or the activities that they take part in. The bill is wide-ranging and deals with the complexities of licensing of various activities, such as owning or using an air weapon, selling and purchasing alcohol, operating taxis or private hire cars, dealing in scrap metal, the holding of public entertainment events, or the running of sexual entertainment venues. There are, of course, some obvious headline stories which emerged from the bill. For example, the creation of two new licensing regimes, one for air weapons and the other for sexual entertainment venues. Both of these aims are praiseworthy, but they are not the only stories we uncovered. So I want to focus members' attention on the other, perhaps less immediately obvious parts of the bill, topics which I and my colleagues believe are equally worthy of prominence in today's debate, and perhaps have a wider impact on those living and working in modern Scotland. Modernity, presiding officer, is also a key theme I wish to explore today. So uh, I want to, to look at how the committee set about the task of scrutinising this diverse bill. The Air Weapons and Licensing Bill was introduced in June last year. This afforded us some time to issue our call for evidence over the summer months, which closed at the end of September, receiving 146 responses. These responses came from a wide section of stakeholder groups, such as local authority, drug and alcohol partnerships, equality organisations, energy and transport providers, as well as the police, to name but a few. And also, we heard from uh, a very wide range of interested individuals. I certainly will. Alex Ferguson. Um, I'm very grateful for, for taking that uh, intervention, Mr Stewart. I just wonder, when the committee was undergoing its scrutiny, and you mentioned Police Scotland, uh, my understanding is that Police Scotland were able to give statistics from April to July 2014 on air gun crime, but that the figures for the year up to April 2014, unlike all previous years, have not been published and that they've been delayed to, to uh, the autumn of this year. Did that give the, the committee any difficulties in having up-to-date information? Um, I, I would say, presiding officer, uh, that we have had information and data from a, a number of years uh, about uh, air weapons offensives and offences, and we are all far too aware of the deaths and injuries that have taken place, uh, the maiming of animals uh, that has gone on across this country. And I really do think uh, that uh, with that information, that gave us a good guide of why uh, I think, and I think the committee thinks, uh, that this uh, air weapons uh, licensing regime should be brought uh, into place. As I said, we heard from a, a wide range of individuals and took a wide range of evidence. And I'd like to thank all of those who responded for the part that they have played in helping us to examine the proposals in the bill. Um, the committee uh, also uh, was given the opportunity to inform ourselves on the consti constituent subject areas. We held a number of informal meetings with academics, industry representatives and licensing experts to aid our understanding. At this point, I would like to take the opportunity to thank former members of the committee, Mark MacDonald, Stuart McMillan and Anne McTaggart for their work in exploring the various strands. And I know uh, that they put in a huge amount of effort in doing so. Uh, while thanking uh, members past, I'd also like to make mention of the new committee members, as it were, Claire Adamson, Cara Hilton and Willie Coffey, who picked up the baton and carried it on to the finishing line. Uh, we held nine themed evidence sessions and heard from the Cabinet Secretary, culminating with our Stage 1 report being unanimously agreed and published. Uh, before I move on to the specifics of our scrutiny and recommendations, uh, I would like to say a little about the committee's engagement activities. Engagement is a key priority for our committee. We've had close to 4,000 new engagements with ordinary people over and above the well-kent faces. Local government is an area where many hold views, but people need to be encouraged to share those views with us 
Engagement is a long-term re relationship where trust is earned. We published a promoted Facebook post on taxi and private hire cars in the Highland area. We did this because of a gap in identified information that we had and, and we required to, to seek further views. That post was shared by 56 people. Our YouTube video on taxes and private hire cars was also a success, amassing close to 1,000 views, demonstrating the level of interest from the public in this topic. Comments we received fed directly into our thinking on the proposals in the bill. Responses to our video suggested in the minds of users uh, of taxes and private hire cars uh, were all to in intents and purposes the same. One of our principal recommendations in this area uh, is the Scottish Government should consider a full, re full review of all aspects of taxi and hire car licensing, because if a licensing system was being designed now, it would, in our opinion, be implemented differently. Our experience of engagement has shown us that to be successful, it has to be well-targeted, relevant and accessible. People have to feel they are being listened to, and the value of their comments needs to be demonstrated. Only then will we encourage those quieter vo voices uh, to enter the discussion. Let me preface my next comments and our findings by saying we support moves to license air weapons and to have a separate licensing regime for sexual entertainment venues. We have made a few recommendations as to how to improve these proposed regimes, although others may like to comment on those as aspects. I'd like to concentrate on some of the key recommendations we make concerning the alcohol, taxi and private hire car and metal dealer provisions in the bill. The alcohol provisions at Part 2 of the Bill contained a number of proposals, but I shall focus on two areas, that of determining over provision of alcohol and on alcohol licensing objectives. Our recommendations are, on these are areas explicitly linked to the overriding objective of advancing public health and preserving public order and safety. Firstly, uh, a little background on over provision. Licensing policy statements must contain a statement as to whether there is over-provision of licensed license premises in any locality within the licensing board's area. The bill should change the definition of over-provision over to enable licensing boards to take into consideration licensed hours as well as the number and capacity of licensed premises. It would also clarify that the whole of a board, board's area can be classed as a locality for the purposes of carrying out the assessment. Trade bodies firmly oppose these changes, questioning their proportionality. On the other hand, police, health boards and alcohol and drug partnerships were strongly supportive. We support the latter group and would go further in efforts to reduce the harm alcohol can cause to some. In terms of licensing statements, we heard suggestions that professional organisers abuse the occasional licence system to evade the requirements of being fully licensed premises, and those events add to the over-provision of alcohol in an area. A similar concern was raised about members clubs, with Alcohol Focus Scotland observing that in the borders, 22% of all licensed premises are members clubs. We therefore recommend club licences and occasional, occasional licences must be included when licensing boards are assessing provision. Given the overwhelming evidence we received of harm and links to disorder from overconsumption, we also re recommend an additional licensing objective be added to the Licensing Scotland Act 2005 to include the reduction and consumption of alcohol. Uh, we spoke, um, presiding officer, to a number of uh, organisations and individuals involved in the taxi and private hire car trade and those who license it. Uh, changes in the market with the advent of hire car bookings uh, must therefore be, take place within a framework that does not allow the fundamental principle of having a licensed driver and a licensed vehicle uh, being uh, the ones that folks can safely use. We want to ensure that the public know that when they call, hail or use an app to get a car, they are entering a licensed vehicle with a licensed driver. Further reasons must also include the delivery of an accessible, reliable and affordable service to customers whilst preventing opportunities for criminal activity. 
Uh, Police Scotland told us regulations ensure legitimate business thrives and provides opportunity to prevent organised crime groups from gaining a foothold in this industry. Finally, President Officer, licensing of metal dealers uh, is extremely important. This is not a victimless crime, and we have heard um, that it costs a great deal uh, in terms of, of money, but also uh, has uh, created real dangers. And I do think uh, that what we must ensure is that the maximum penalty uh, for this crime be uprated from the current uh, £5,000. Um, presiding Officer, uh, in conclusion, uh, I would hope that my contribution to today's debate has provided a flavour of the range of issues the committee encountered when scrutinising the bill and sets out some of the areas we wish to see strengthened in the bill. Licensing is important to all our lives. It keeps us safe, cares for our health and reduces the opportunity for crime in our communities. And I commend the committee's stage one report to the Parliament. Thank you, convener. And I now call on Alec Crowley. Uh, ten minutes or so, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, can I firstly say that Labour supports the principles set out in the policy memorandum of this bill. We will be supporting it today at Stage 1, and we are keen to work with the Government at Stage 2 to agree any amendments that we think can improve the bill as it progresses and goes to Stage 3. I would also want to put on record our thanks to the work of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee for their work in scrutinising what is a lengthy and complex bill with many different parts to it, all of which are important in their own right. Indeed, I do wonder if this is the best way to make legislation, to just lump all these areas of licensing together and try and come up with improvements, often adding on to previous legislation that is itself outdated. The policy memorandum states that the principal policy objectives of the Bill are to strengthen and improve aspects of locally led alcohol and civic government licensing in order to preserve public order and safety, reduce crime and advance public health. This has been achieved through reforms to the existing systems, to alcohol licensing, taxing private hire car licensing, metal dealer licensing, and giving local communities a new power to regulate sexual entertainment venues in their area. So in the time I have this afternoon, I could not possibly cover everything that has been packed into this bill, but it is withdrawn to the attention of the Parliament some of the views that have come through the evidence received. The committee report states that the bill is what could be described as a pick and mix. I am not sure that this is the best way to have dealt with all the matters the government want to address, and I do think a future government will have to return to some aspects of this bill sooner rather than later. The minister told the committee he had no plans to fundamentally review the 1982 Act, as it was reviewed only some ten years ago and found fit for purpose. But the practitioners, the people out there on the front line dealing with the legislation on a daily basis, they had something different to say. So are the Society of Local Authority Lawyers and administration, Administrators in Scotland, their licensing group said, we would reiterate that the Act is now 30 years old and it is becoming increasingly difficult to address modern business activity within the structure of that Act. Edinburgh Council said that the continued, the continued amendment of the Act is not helpful. And one of their officers told the committee the 1982 Act has probably passed its sell by date. Glasgow Council agreed with one of their officials telling the committee, and I quote, any change would have to be substantial. I am teetering on the brink of saying that I do not think that enough amendments could be made to the bill to address the issues. The fundamental issue is that the 1982 Act has been in place for more than 30 years. It has served its purpose. It has had its time. It needs to be rebuilt from the ground up in line with the 2005 Act and to set out an entirely different framework for how we approach licensing. licensing. I do suggest to the Minister that he should look again at the evidence that was given when it comes to this part of the Bill. 
The Glasgow official suggested that the Parliament would have to go right back to the beginning and start again with the 1982 Act so that it could pass legislation that was fit for purpose in a modern Scotland. I know that the SNP have a majority, can pass what they want, but it is surely about getting it right, and there are too many voices suggesting that we cannot keep amending 30-year-old legislation and get it right for what is best for Scotland. And this is an issue that I think I would want to take up with the Minister. I now want to move on to the proposals for air weapons. As the committee report says, there are two camps on this part those for and those against. Labour will support the proposals and the principle of the policy memorandum which we believe the Bill achieves, which is to recognise the need to protect and reassure the public in a way which is proportionate and practical. I am pleased to note that the Government is supportive of many of the points the Committee made and will make sure that there is plenty of publicity in the lead-in to the legislation coming into effect and that those who no longer have the need for a gun will be encouraged to hand those weapons in. As I said, we have heard the arguments from both sides of this debate, but for me the evidence shows clearly that the legislation is the right thing to do. With regard to the introduction of a licence for sexual entertainment venues, we believe this is necessary as there is no adequate regulation in place at present. The Bill will empower local authorities to be able to determine whether or not such venues can operate within their areas, and this is a step in the right direction. Representations have been made and the committee has made specific recommendations which I hope will be brought forward at stage two. We will also want to explore with the government other areas of concern and possible amendments for stage two that have been raised through groups such as Zero Tolerance. These include allowing under 18s to work in such venues. The committee did look at this, and I know the Minister did not think the Bill could address the issue, but we would like further discussion with him about this. The fact that there is no fit and proper test for a licensee of a sexual entertainment venue included in the Bill is an issue raised that we would also welcome further discussion on. There is no provision on the face of the Bill to restrict signage and advertising of sexual entertainment venues, and again we would like further discussion around this. There is no provision on the face of the Bill about community consultation on the provision of sexual entertainment venue licences, and in line with previous legislation that, this, that the Committee looked at around the Community Empowerment Bill, we do believe that, again, this is an area that we should explore further. And there is no provision on licensing fees. There is a view that these should be much higher than for running a venue which is open to all sections of society, such as a cafe or a pub. Many English and Welsh local authorities have imposed high fees since their new sexual entertainment venue regime came into force. Examples are Birmingham City Council charge over £6,200 for a sexual entertainment venue licence, whereas a skin piercer licence would cost £87. Manchester City Council charges £4,425 for a, a sexual entertainment venue licence, but a cafe licence would start from around £100. So there is an argument being made that we should look again at the costs and whether um, these, these types of venues should pay a, a larger licensing fee. There is no requirement for a license policy statement, as this is discretionary within the Bill as it stands. We would prefer that this is to be mandatory so that a licensing committee is able to make a public statement about their intention in terms of the licensing of these venues and their understanding of the wider policy environment in which they operate. Again, we would like to have a discussion with the Minister around that. These are all matters that I would hope we can have dialogue with, with the Minister over the coming weeks. On the question of changes to the licence of taxis, we heard evidence from the operators, the Scottish Taxi Federation and the licensing boards, all of whom were fairly positive for the proposals. 
For my part, I have certainly written to operators in my constituency and will be meeting with them soon to get their take on where we are at. With reference to scrap metal, this brings us in line with the rest of the UK, which is important as there are no borders when it comes to theft of such materials. Metal thefts threaten the safety of the public and causes a huge amount of disruption to energy supply, transport, communication and other industries which people rely on. So Labour supports the proposals that have been brought forward in the Bill. In conclusion, President Officer, there are issues I have highlighted and I hope we can all work together to strengthen any aspects of the Bill at Stage 2 and 3, and I do hope that the Minister will consider the evidence in terms of the 1982 Act, which was fairly overwhelming from those who are the practitioners in the field. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Cameron Buchanan. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Air Weapons and Licensing Bill covers a wide range of matters and as such it requires consideration of a broad range of principles, some of which I will touch on here. Before we venture into the specific details, I would first like to set out two overarching principles that under, under, underpin our position. The first is that legislation should be passed only when it is considered to be good government, not just when it is thought by some to be good politics. The second is that legislation should be targeted. Law-abiding people should not find themselves caught under a legis legislative net just because it is politically expedient for the government to impose obligations. The area of the bill concerning air guns, or air weapons as the government wants to call them, raises concerns both in principle and in practice. This is because it seems partly to be about looking tough rather than sensibly tackling pressing issues. Indeed, crimes involving air guns fell by 75% between 2006 and 2013, a figure that surely indicates the problem is, is of misuse is receding rather than growing. No doubt some, some people would want to intervene at this point to say that criminal misuse of air guns should be tackled, whether or not the levels are falling. I absolutely agree on this point, but I think making a big show of requiring licensing of all air guns is not a sensible way of going about it. It may gather less attention, but better enforcement of existing legislation will be targeted and a better act of government. Well, Certainly. Kevin Stewart. Um, well, well, Mr. Buchanan recognise that we're not talking about the licensing of individual weapons, but we are talking about the licensing of individuals. And that even during the course uh, of the deliberations uh, that we had, the committee itself heard of cases uh, of maimings uh, of people. We heard of a serious incident in Durham. And of course, we have had past deaths. Does he not think that individuals who have these weapons should have to be licensed before they can get them? Cameron Buchanan. Thank you very much. Is there any evidence that, that licensing will actually reduce these instances? I'm not really sure about this. I think that what, what is going to happen here is that some people want to intervene criminal misuse of air guns should be tackled whether or not the levels are falling. I absolutely agree, but I think making a show of licensing all air guns is not a sensible way of going about it. It may gather less attention, but I think a better enforcement of existing legislation would be targeted and a better act of government. Kevin Stewart. You, you fell into the same trap there about the licensing of individual weapons. We are not talking about the licensing of each individual weapon. We are talking about the licensing of people who own these weapons. And I think we've got to get that right, uh, Presiding Officer. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. Yes, I do know that. That's, thank you very much indeed. Making everyone who wants to own or use an, use an air gun and apply for a licence is certainly not targeted. Why should innocent users who want to shoot for sport be forced to go through a cumbersome licensing processes that charges for the privilege. I, for one, consider that when there is a problem, a government should seek to address it without imposing itself unnecessarily. Lazily casting aside legis the legislative net over every current and potential air gun user certainly breaches this principle, which is particularly, I think, worrying when the problem is a question is confined to a tiny minority of users. Furthermore, a vast new air gun licensing regime would bring practical difficulties. At the moment, we estimate there are around half a million air guns in Scotland, which are, for all intents and purposes, untraceable. For Police Scotland to license and track these would also be very difficult, and I know this is not proposed, but if it's the people who are using them, and then I think they will go undercover. Considerable, is, it that, sorry, is it the public's best interest to invest police time and resources, and I think this is crucial, in licensing 
air guns or licensing people to use air guns when Police Scotland are facing increasingly budgetary constraints and pressures on its staffing infrastructure? Most people, I think, would think not. I'd like to move now on to alcohol licensing provisions. I will first say that I agree that overconsumption of alcohol is a very serious problem that must be addressed. I also think that it is useful to clarify the powers that licensing board have to avoid confusion or uncertainty in future. However, I think it is important that aspiring small business owners do not face unnecessary barriers to entry that their competitors did not have to face. On a similar note, I remain concerned with the potential power of licensing authorities to refuse to grant a license for a private hire vehicle on the grounds of over-provision. I feel this is anti-competitive and simply not in the best interests of people we should be helping, which is the consumers. Greater provision of private hire vehicles will allow more people to access this form of transport than ever before. But I think this government is proposing direct barriers to entry that would block consumer benefits as well as the, prevent the creation of jobs in what is genuinely an expanding industry. The mechanism to allow licensing authorities to require knowledge tests for drivers of private hire vehicles, private hire vehicles has a similar effect. Regulatory barriers to entry will restrict growth in the industry. And I don't think it is now necessary with the advent of TomTom, Garmin and Sat satellite navigation. I think this will cost jobs and acting against consumers' interests. I will always maintain that governments should support innovation and refuse to protect vested interests from fair competition they find inconvenient. Having said all of this, there are some areas of the bill that I am in agreement with. The removal of the requirement for metal dealerships to hold metal for 48 hours before processing is a very welcome example of government stepping back and removing costly reg regulation. On a visit I made to William Och Stra Scrap Metal Recyclers in Granton, I saw for myself the large amount of space and therefore expense required to comply with this. The provisions requiring payment in cash would also help to increase transparency, which would be beneficial provided that the definitions are clear. As for provisions regarding theatres, they may bring increased flexibility and consistency across the licensing of public entertainment venues, which I think would be welcome. It seems that in a bill of so many parts, there are some aspects that are sensible, and it would have been beneficial if this bill had been divided into two, as my colleague Alex Rowley stated in his speech. It is clear that this bill would need to be amended, I think, substantially at, this at the next legislative stage. As a result, I will be submitting amendments at stage two that seek to apply the principle of sensible, targeted government throughout the bill. According to the presiding officer, I hope that today's debate will draw out in the open the key areas of the bill where work is still needed. I've only done, touched on some aspects, which my colleagues might come on to others. In some aspects, such as the licensing of air guns, I think a considerable change in policy is required. However, I also wish to reiterate my view that there are some provisions within the bill that appear to be very sensible. From this position, I will seek to amend the bill in such a way that it will make it overall impact targeted, beneficial and fair. For these reasons, the Scottish Conservatives will be abstaining at decision time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now turn to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes, please. At this stage, I have a little bit of time in hand for interventions. I call Claire Adamson to be followed by Cara Hilton. The convener of the committee has already mentioned that I did come somewhat late to the bill, um, having joined the committee in November of last year. But I would like to pay tribute to the many witnesses who have contributed to the Stage 1 proceedings, um, both um, by appearing before committee and in the written evidence. And indeed, I thank those who have submitted, the many organisations, stakeholders have submitted briefings um, for today's um, proceedings in the chamber this afternoon. It has been mentioned this is a very broad and diverse bill covering many topics that fall within its remit. Um, I suspect that I would not be able to cover all of the areas of the bill today. However, um, I hope to link them in some way in that um, my main concern will be in relation to the area of safety. Um, I believe that every member of the committee and everyone in the chamber today will be looking for an outcome of safer, healthier communities. Um, and um, I'm sure that the, the, we would all agree that that is the outcome we would want from the intended changes within the bill. Um, I did think we had a bit more consensus on the committee. I'm surprised that the Conservatives have chosen to abstain today because um, yeah, all of the members in the committee um, ag agreed with the report and, and, and there didn't seem to be much contention at that time about um, the report from the committee. Um, I listened to Alex Rowley um, talking about how um, he felt that maybe the complexity in bringing together of many items um, was um, a mistake in this area. 
Um, yes, I'll take an intervention. Thank Candidate you very much. Hannan. I just wanted to say, unfortunately, due to my relatively limited parliamentary experience, brief parliamentary experience, I didn't realise the full implication of my acquiescence at the committee stage one of the bill, which is why I agreed to it. Thank you. Clear out, Jason. Thank you for the explanation, Mr Cameron. Um, what I would say is, Alex Shirley, um, it reminded me of a, an old joke about a traveller seeking directions from a local um, to be met with. Well, I wouldn't start from here. But we are here. We, can't, we don't have a blank sheet of paper. We have to work within the constraints, the capacities and, and the, the existing law that we have both in this place and in the local government level. So I do think the, the way the government has um, presented the bill is, is, is possibly um, the, the only way forward at this stage to address some of these very serious issues. If I could turn to air guns and licensing, um, I do think that... Um, despite um, some of the comments this afternoon, that um, this is a proportionate and a reasonable way to approach air gun licensing. Um, we cannot forget where this has come from. Um, few of us will, will forget um, young boy Andrew Morton, two-year-old, who was killed in Glasgow. And indeed, his parents um, campaign to have the issue of air gun licensing addressed in Scotland. Uh, but I believe it was a, a nominee, if not the winner, of one of the um, press awards uh, in the year that of following Andrew's death. And um, it, it's these tragedies, it's these individual cases um, where this system is completely inadequate in protecting our communities that I'm sure has driven us to where we are at the moment. And I do think that what we have is the right balance between protecting communities and allowing the legitimate use of shooting in a safe environment to continue. We've taken um, evidence from scouting organisations, from people who work with air guns in their day-to-day -day lives, from apprentices. And I do think that we have, this bill does strike the right balance between what is um, in the best interest of our communities going forward. It's estimated that there... Yes. Alec Ferguson. Thank you. I'm very, I'm very grateful to the member for taking the intervention. And I, I, I totally agree. The type of crime to which she's referred is utterly unacceptable in any, in any society. But I wonder if she can tell me of the evidence that she heard on the committee that suggests that an air gun uh, or a, a, a regime to license the people who own an air gun uh, would prevent that sort of crime because I simply cannot find that evidence. Well, I, I, I did. I was at the committee at the time when the police gave their evidence in this area and um, they, they spoke of their frustration at their inability to address um, air guns in premises where they are suspected of other crimes being committed and the fact that um, whether it's domestic abuse, whether it's um, drug crime, whether it's any kind of crime in our community their inability to do anything about air guns being present in, in these, these areas. So I've, I found the police evidence um, compelling um, the Scottish Farms Arms Consultative Panel estimate that there are 500,000 air weapons currently in circulation in Scotland um, I have to say one of them is in my loft and has been for the last 20 years. Um, and, and I believe that that's the case for most of these weapons. They've been bought for recreational use at some point. My husband and his, his father were, were both scout leaders and used it um, to train scouts. But nonetheless, the weapon remains in circulation. And I think that um, the, the, the sort of amnesty period and, and the, the ability for people to hand in weapons that are no longer in use will make our, our um, community safer. I'm sh very rapidly running out of time, presiding officer. But if I could turn to the metal, metal dealers and um, really metal theft and what that means to our communities. As someone who represents the Auckland Geek area in, in Moodysburn, um, I, I was absolutely appalled when the um, fundraising had been done by the local community and the miners there to, 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 to make a memorial of, of the Auckland Geek disaster from 1959. Um, to have that memorial stolen within a matter of weeks um, was, of course, um, a, a real blow to that community, an emotional blow, and, and one that was um, felt by everyone who, from an industrial background in, in the Lanarkshire area. Um, it was um, replaced with um, a, a very generous donation from a local businessman, but um, when things affect our built terraces and memorials, the fabric of our community and our historic buildings, it does have a detrimental effect on our communities that cannot be measured. Um, uh, whether that's led from a church roof or the destruction of an historic building or indeed the theft from memorials, which we've seen more and more in the, pa the past time. But we also have to look at the often disproportionate impact in the economy of an area of the value of the, where the value of the metal theft is as nothing to the disproportionate cost to the local economy and the disruption to infrastructure, whether that be to telecommunications, 
rail or road infrastructure. And I'm really glad that that is being addressed within the, um, the, the remit of this, this bill. I'm not sure if I've got much more time, presiding officer. Just a little bit. A little bit. If I could just talk about the taxi app situation. There was a lot of talk about the, the changes in technology. As someone who's a technologist, I was very interested in this. But only last week, there was a case in Edinburgh of a young woman um, who alleged, this alleged crime where she, she got into what she thought was a private hire t um, car and was taken away and, and was um, sexually assaulted. And I think um, when we put safety at the very heart of what we're doing, I think that the opportunity, we should look to the opportunities of apps where um, some of the apps that are on the market at the moment provide you a picture of the driver, they provide the licence of the car that's picking you up and they can track the journey as well. So while these are seen as a threat in some areas, I think there's a great opportunity to improve safety and I think that will be driven by the market. Thank you. Many thanks. I call Cara Hilton to be followed by Gil Patterson. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by adding my thanks to all those who have contributed towards getting the bill to this stage and have provided us with the excellent um, evidence and briefings. Um, like Claire, I'm new to the committee. I only joined in January, so I missed some of the evidence that we received. Um, as Alec Rowley said, Scottish Labour is supporting the bill at stage one. But as he also pointed out, the bill is so wide-ranging that it might have been more effective to have several small bills rather than tagging everything together. Um, I intend to focus on section 6 to 8 of the bill, which is an area which I believe needs to be strengthened considerably. Um, in his briefing for today's debate, the Commissioner for Children and Young People, Tam Bailey, has drawn our attention to the fact that the bill, as drafted, would allow children under the age of 18 to work in sexual entertainment venues, so long as there is no actual entertainment taking place at the time. Zero Tolerance have also expressed serious concerns about this provision and have warned that it could create a groomer's charter, allowing venues to employ teenage girls to work as cleaners, for example, and then persuade them to become dancers when they reach 18. They also highlight the fact that many of these venues screen pornography in the background, and obviously this gives rise to concerns about child protection too. I know that during stage one evidence, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice advised that these issues couldn't be addressed within the scope of the bill, but Zero Tolerance and the Commission for Child Commissioner for Children and Young People disagree. And I share the view, their view that no um, child under the age of 18 should be allowed to work in or attend a sexual entertainment venue in any capacity. So I hope that this, this is an area that the Scottish Government can uh, look again at to see how we can protect young people more. In respect of the proposed regime itself, well, there is no doubt that sticking to the status quo isn't an option and Scottish Labour does support change in principle. I think we've also got to consider very carefully too whether there could be unintended consequences from this bill. There's a real risk um, that in licensing these venues the Scottish Government also risks normalising what is a harmful form of sexual exploitation. As Zero Tolerance have pointed out in their briefing note for today, if we're to move beyond women's value and worth being located in their body bodies and their perceived sexual attractiveness, we need to move beyond seeing sexual entertainment venues as normal and harmless. This is a view echoed by the Commissioner for Children and Young People, who has said that the idea that children could be working in these venues and exposed to degrading images of women simply doesn't sit well with the Scottish Government's own equally safe strategy to end violence against women and girls. This strategy rightly places at its heart the recognition of the links between discrimination, objectification and violence against women, women and aspires to, and I quote, create a strong and flourishing Scotland where all individuals are equally safe and respected. But normalising these venues risks sending out the wrong message to young people and especially to young girls. And we only need to look at some of the customer reviews of these venues to get a real flavour of the lack of respect that the clientele have for the women that work there. There's a real risk that by regulating the sector we could end up expanding an industry that is harmful to women and it's especially harmful to our children undermining all the good work to address unequal power relationships, to tackle gender stereotypes and to achieve true gender equality. So I hope that the government will be favourable to this section being amended at, st at stage two. Sticking to the same theme of protecting children and young people from harmful sexual images, one area which I believe the bill should also go much further is to restrict the display of harmful sexualised content in areas where children could see it, such as on supermarket shelves. And here I would like to highlight the fantastic Girls Guide campaign, Girls Matter, which is aimed at ensuring that the issues that matter to girls are addressed in the 2015 general election campaign. 
And while in recent months we've spent a lot of time arguing about full fiscal autonomy and about which of us is most anti-austerity, the Girls Matter campaign is calling for politicians to take action on the issues that really do matter to children and to young girls. And one of the is key issues that they're asking politicians of all parties to take action on is children's exposure to harmful sexualised content in the media. And this is absolutely vital because the research has found that 75% of girls and women, no, no time, sorry, girls and women aged 11 to 21 and 48% of 7 to 10 year olds believe that there are too many images of naked or near naked women in the media. The majority of young girls, almost 60%, have experienced sexual harassment at school, college or work in the last year. A staggering um, 40 per cent say that they sometimes feel ashamed of how they look and that they don't take part in fun activities like sport because they feel self-conscious. And given that the images that girls are exposed to on a daily basis on YouTube and magazines, newspapers, uh, music videos, is it any wonder that they feel pressure to conform to ideals that are often unachievable? And this isn't just undermining girls' self-esteem. The harsh reality is that the way women are portrayed in the media um, and these venues entrenches gender inequality and the unequal power relationships that are at the root of abuse and violence against women and girls. So I, I don't want my uh, six-year-old daughter growing up in a Scotland where women are viewed as sexualised objects or where women are judged on, um, how, on how they look. Where, where gender is, uh, uh, is, you know, I want my, my daughter to grow up in a, a society where gender is no, is no barrier to success, where every child is uh, treated equal. And it's time for us to start taking responsibility to make sure that the images that are portrayed of women and young girls are realistic ones. I think we've got the opportunity to do that here and now in this bill. Uh, one measure we could take would be to make it an offence to knowingly display harmful sexualised content on the front pages of women, of magazines and newspapers that are in sight of children's uh, eyes, and I intend to submit um, amendments on this at stage two. The bill gives us scope two to act to put restrictions in place on signage and on advertising of sexual entertainment venues. And in this respect, I notice the Cabinet Secretary has referred to this in his letter to the committee, and I hope that this is an issue that we can progress on. So we all aspire to a Scotland where equality is not just an aspiration but a reality and I think we should use the powers in this bill to make this happen. Let's ensure that girls really do matter, that their voices are heard and that we do all we can in this bill to tackle the exploitation of women and girls wherever and whenever this takes place. Thank you. I have indicated to the Chamber that I have a little bit of time in hand for interventions but it is of course up to members whether they wish to take interventions or not. If they do not then I would suggest they try to stick to their six minutes. Gil Patterson to be followed by Elaine Murray. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I say to Cara Hilton, first of all, I share all the views that she expressed with regards to broadcasting and internet uh, uh, scenes that, that are explicitly available. Unfortunately, this Parliament doesn't have any powers to, to do anything about them. Uh, can I say that uh, I'm not a member of the committee, uh, but when looking at the title of the bill, it appears to be straightforward enough. But as organisations and constituents started con contacting me ahead of this debate, I realised that the bill was wide-ranging in its names. And for that, I applaud the Scottish Government and, of course, the Local Government and the Regeneration Committee on the extensive work that they have carried out to bring it on to this stage one today. Uh, in my contribution, I intend to focus primarily on two aspects of the bill. Firstly, the licensing of alcohol, which is part of the larger approach to dealing with a relationship with alcohol and the negative impact it has on a number of our citizens and communities. Secondly, I will look, look at the provisions contained within the bill that aim to tackle the increasing pro problem of metal theft in our country. As a former member of the Health and Sport Committee, I have been involved in a great deal of the evidence taking uh, and uh, roundtable discussions regarding the impact of alcohol on Scottish society. The Scottish Government and indeed all parties represented across this chamber are committed to tackling this problem. The impact of alcohol on the health of adults is well documented, but alcohol has an even greater effect on the health of young people. That's why I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has announced in this bill that it will uh, close the legal loophole and, uh, that allows for adults to purchase alcohol for, for someone under the age of 18 if the alcohol is then consumed in public. This, this loophole has encouraged outdoor drinking 
dens of young people, which are detrimental to the young people's health, but have also led to concerns being expressed by people who are afraid of groups of young people, especially if they have been drinking. For this to work, however, I would advise that the police use their discretion to avoid being overactive in their enforcement, as it will only lead to these drinking dens going underground, which may be indeed harder for them to police. Whilst there must be a focus on those who purchase alcohol, it is also paramount that when licensing boards are considering someone's application to sell alcohol, the board is provided with wide-ranging information to ensure that the applicant passes a fit and proper test. The fit and proper test tests exist in many licensing regimes, and I'm pleased that this bill incorporates it into the alcohol licensing re regime. Uh, this will offer some comfort to families across Scotland that those who hold an alcohol, alcohol uh, licence have went through a vigorous process that they can be trusted and their char character is fit and proper to sell alcohol. These are, po uh, these are positive steps in the campaign to changing our relationship with the alcohol and I very much welcome the proposals. As I st start, st stated at the start of this contribution, a second aspect of the bill I would like to focus on is the provision and that aim to reduce uh, metal theft. I have been approached by a number of constituents, including uh, from religious, uh, a religious background, who have raised their concerns uh, over the increasing problem of metal theft and have themselves and their establishments been victims of this crime. Metal theft does not have a negative, uh, uh, not, sorry, metal theft does not only have a negative um, uh, effect on those affected, but it also has a, da a, a dangerous uh, 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 impact on those who are carrying, up, uh, carrying out the theft in the first place. So I'm pleased that the Scottish Government acknowledges and, uh, uh, that, that efforts to reduce metal theft requires legislative action, and the proposals within the bill offers uh, this action. Whilst it is important to, to bring forward preventative action to ensure that metal theft doesn't happen in the first place, life must be made very uncomfortable for the thieves to try and dispose of the stolen metal. I believe that by introducing effective regulation of the metal dealing industry, it will become more difficult for thieves to dispose of their stolen material. Genuine me metal dealers who provide a valuable service to the community and manufacturers will be protected by the legislation as it is aimed to target those unscrupulous dealers who offer a way for the metal thieves to dispose of their stolen goods. By cutting off this route, it is hoped that metal thieves will be discouraged from stealing in the first place and that ensure our churches and railways are, dis are not despoiled and damaged. I, will, I did not focus too long on other aspects of the bill, as I am sure colleagues will do so in greater detail, but I certainly am one person that welcomes the government's commitment to licensing uh, air weapons. I think this is one of the most significant parts of uh, this, and if it protects one child or one animal, then I'm for it. Uh, in the wrong hands, air weapons are a danger to our communities, wild and pet farm animals, and, a, a, a system and the system proposed within the bill offers measures that are proportionate and practical. Presiding officer, I commend the bill to the Parliament. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Elaine Murray to be followed by Colin Keir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I am not a member of any of the committees which have considered the bill, uh, and therefore I'm going to focus my contribution on, on three areas of the bill. Uh, the first is, is air weapons. I have no wish to prevent people with a legitimate reason for owning an air gun uh, from being able to do so, and I don't think anybody uh, in this Parliament does want to see air guns banned altogether. Uh, but it has to be recognised that air guns are weapons. They use pneumatic uh, technology and in fact air weapons were used in hunting and in war in previous centuries until the firearms technology overtook them. We know that they can kill, we uh, 
uh, Claire Adamson made reference to the horrific case of the murder of two-year-old Andrew Morton, but the extent of the misuse of air weapons was revealed by ACC Wayne Mawson in evidence to the Local Government Committee when he advised that between April and July 2014, Police Scotland had recorded 84 offences specifically involving air weapons, six of which involved injury to animals and nine involved a human, injury to human beings, including one attempted murder. And air weapons are often implicated in criminal activity. Almost half of the firearms related offences involved air weapons, and they are frequently used in attacks on both domestic and wild animals. Last year in Dumfries and Gallo, there was reports of a, somebody's 13 year old pet cat having to be put, destroyed after an air gun pellet was uh, injured its legs. Air, air weapons are often used against rabbits, rodents, and other animals considered to be pests. Uh, but they're not always used by people who are trained how to use them properly. So they're uh, cruelty and animal welfare considerations which militate against the continuation of unregulated ownership of air, weapon, air weapons. I'm not sure I really followed uh, Cameron Buchanan's argument, but it seemed to me that the, like, legal, le the logical extension of that would be actually be the banning of uh, the licensing for firearms. I mean, you could, use, you could apply the same arguments to licensing of firearms. I'm sure, I would imagine that nobody in particular would want to reverse all that. We do need to take air weapons seriously. There are half a million of them estimated in Scotland. That does present a challenge, and I understand that, that there is an argument that it will probably be the law-abiding, responsible air gun owner who uses the guns for legitimate uh, purposes who will be the first to comply. But that is the truth with most legislation, as the, the law-abiding people who are, are first to comply. I also appreciate the resourcing issues for Police Scotland uh, and that the uh, ministers are seeking ways of ameliorating these pressures and the committee has made a number of rep recommendations on that. I think the committee is right in making a strong recommendation that there needs to be a comprehensive public information campaign beginning well in advance of the commen commencement of the licensing regime. Uh, I think that can also should be uh, about informing owners, but it's also an opportunity to change attitudes towards air weapons to make to the public realise that they're a lot more dangerous and the sort of damage they can do in the wrong hands. When I was a child, my father had an air rifle and he enjoyed what I understand from the report is known as blinking. He even actually allowed my sister and I to do it on occasions, probably at some danger to the, uh, our neighbours, I would imagine, in my, my case anyway. Uh, and in those days, actually, the, the sort of air ownership and use of air guns was totally acceptable. He did keep the air gun locked safely, safely away, but that was like 40 odd years ago and attitudes do need to move on from then. The dangers of the misuse of air weapons to humans and animals outweighs the arguments that anyone who wants to should have the right to enjoy informal target practice at home. I also welcome the long-awaited proposals and measures to deter metal theft, though I agree with the committee that these could be further strengthened. Uh, back in 2014, Ivor Williamson, the owner of Rosefield Salvage in Dumfries, visited one of my advice surgeries to argue for a ban on all cash payments for metal. He believed that that was the only way to really combat illicit trade in metals. Genuine metal dealers like his company have nothing to fear for, from, for example, a national register for metal de dealers in Scotland or modernising the definition of a metal dealer. Metal theft inconveniences at the very least, but it often endangers life. And I've noticed living near the A75, there's a stretch of the fence along there which is routinely taken away uh, from a field where children play, where dogs are walked, and where there could be danger for, from people running onto the road. My final comments on the bill relate to the proposals for the licensing of the sexual entertainment industry prompted by the Bright Crew versus City of Glasgow Court of Session opinion. I agree with the Scottish Government in its violence against women strategy that commercial sexual exploitation constitutes violence against women. That is harmful not just to the women being exploited, but to all women because, it, because of the attitudes towards women and their bodies which it promotes. I would prefer that no such establishment existed. I cannot accept the argument that the commercial provision of the entertainment providing sexual stimulation is necessary to attract businesses, business conventions to a city, as one witness appears to have suggested. In my view, establishments which encourage men to objectify and depersonalise women have no place in a modern and progressive country. I can have sympathy with the arguments for an outright ban and that regulation might imply acceptance of the attitude towards women that these establishments promote. However, I also agree with zero tolerance that regulation is better than the current situation. 
Local authorities in Scotland have taken different views on the sexual entertainment in industry, as they have done on prostitution. So it is perhaps appropriate that these decisions are taken at a local authority level. However, I hope that it would be possible for a local authority which does not wish to allow any such activity to be able to set their appropriate number of venues at zero, and I would hope that many authorities would do so. I would just like to finish on a suggestion related to appropriate numbers of venues, but is isn't actually in the legislation. Um, I've been... Uh, members of local authorities have, have said to me that they feel powerless to prevent the proliferation of betting shops and gambling establishments in some communities. And I think at some stage, obviously it's not part of this bill, but I would like to think at some stage that we would give some consideration to whether or not local authorities uh, are required to have more powers to be able to set appropriate limits uh, for the number of gaming and, and betting establishments in particular communities too. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Colin Keir to be followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm not a member of the committee, but can I thank them and, uh, for producing this report, which is uh, very welcome. Uh, I would like to restrict my comments to the sections in Part 3 of the Bill relating to taxi and private hire licensing. In my previous life as an Edinburgh councillor, I was the convener of the Regulatory Committee, effectively made me the spokesman for the then administration on taxi and private hire licensing. As the committee report points out, the main reason for licensing taxis and PHCs is that the general public must have confidence in the knowledge that it's safe to get into a vehicle and there is a fit and proper person behind the wheel. There's also the issue of ensuring that any operating company is not a front for organised crime. My first television interview as a, on licensing as a local politician some years ago was in relation to an incident where a young lady got into a vehicle thinking it was a taxi. She was taken by the driver to a secluded spot where she was then subjected to a serious sexual assault. This is why I feel so strongly that we must have a robust licensing system and for the most part, the trade, uh, in, uh, taxi and private hire trade are of a similar mind. <coughs> so that those who have been subjected to attacks such as this in the past feel that we as legislators are listening to them and that everyone is safe using taxis and private hire cars at any time. The Civic Government Scotland Act of 1982 was legislation written at a time when technology as we know it didn't exist. If I start with the, uh, no one today, sorry, had thought of mobile phones as we use them today. They were massive in early uh, use, and certainly nobody had heard of such things as apps. But if I may start with the issue of booking offices, I absolutely disagree with the comments attributed in paragraph 311 of the report, to, which were attributed to Audrey Watson of West Lothian Licensing Board. Uh, although Police Scotland can, could investigate nationally, in my opinion, it's vital that booking offices are local to the licensing authority area or a short distance from the area that they're licensed to operate in. This allows the police or the licensing authority to easily check on driver and vehicle movements. To say, as Audrey Watson suggests, that a booking office didn't have to be in Scotland would demand an almost unlimited amount of trust to be placed on a taxi or PHC operator. And while most operations are professionally run, there have been odd exceptions over the years. I believe that local licensing authorities should have not just the right to suspend a driver or vehicle or an oper operator's license, but should also, in extreme circumstances, be able to revoke a license, something we don't actually have just now. I say this because there are examples of, after a suspension of license, unscrupulous operators changing their day-to-day -day named operating manager or changing the ownership of an incorporated company while they fight license suspension in order to give the impression there's been a substantive change to the business. And I know that the current regulatory committee convener of the City of Edinburgh Council, Councillor Barry, would be supportive of such a change, as he informed me of his frustrations in combating unprofessional and unsafe practices within a small minority of the taxi and PHC trades in Edinburgh. So booking offices are key within the local licensing systems with regards to public safety and accessing records. 
This has to be the case for traditionally run taxi and PHC companies, but also those who use apps as a method of communications with their customers. Indeed, any company, apps-based or traditional, should only be allowed, surely, to operate if they do so, taking cognizance of local conditions set down by the local authority licensing. If I may move on to the issue of limiting numbers of vehicles and unmet demand, in my experience, this has been one of the most contentious subjects over many, many years, particularly here in the city of Edinburgh. And I suspect the same will happen should we uh, decide to extend the right of licensing authorities to limit private hire car numbers. Now, I have absolutely no objection at all, in fact, having seen the mess that some cities get themselves into with the vast uh, amount of private hire cars or taxi in an unregulated manner. And oddly enough, this uh, debate and the comments made by Mr Buchanan uh, earlier on actually mirror a debate we had in the City Council back in 2007. Uh, so I have to say the Conservatives have not actually changed <laughs> their view in that time. So I say I have absolutely no problem with the, the limiting. Indeed, I say I was a supporter of that policy for taxis at that time when I was in charge of licensing here in the capital. I would, however, say that in order to help licensing authorities, an accepted, an accepted method of the calculation of unmet demand, which has always been a problem, should be made available and agreed. For those who have had license applications refused, it's been too easy to run off to the Sheriff Court, make an appeal based on ex no real accepted methodology being in place. In a licensing system that litigation has been frequently used by many, I believe that it would make sense for a more prescriptive change to the Civic Government Scotland Act in certain circumstances in order to make it easier for local authorities as well as keeping uh, the cost of license application or amendments manageable for applicants. So I welcome this report and well done to the committee for doing so because when you look at limiting numbers, the ability to ensure that private hire drivers can be tested something I have no problem with in principle are done locally in a correct manner. And I would also like to see vehicles and drivers currently exempt, such as stretched limousines brought into the regulated system for safety uh, purposes. Once again, I commend the committee, not just for the bill's scrutiny, but for opening up the discussion within the report, which I think has been high, very, very useful. And I support the general principles of the bill. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Tavish Scott to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Firstly, my apologies for being a minute late at the start of proceedings uh, today. I no good, I've got no good reason at all. Uh, my legs just didn't get me here quick enough. Um, firstly, I have some sympathy with the, Minister, the Cabinet Secretary for um, his responsibilities now for licensing. I had, um, uh, I had uh, previous responsibility for a licensing bill back in 2005, and uh, I recall um, the best advice I got uh, as to how to understand the extent of problem over provision then was part of the issues that we were dealing with as a, as a government. Um, uh, and that that was uh, very simple. This, this advice came from the most civ senior civil servant in the department, which was to spend as much time as I could in the bars of Glasgow and Edinburgh on a Saturday night at one o'clock in the morning, uh, which wasn't exactly the advice I expected to get from a senior civil servant, but it's nevertheless advice I considered very carefully. Uh, I also spent a lot of time with the division of uh, then Strathclyde's police, uh, looking at what happened at 3am uh, uh, on a Sunday morning and how they dealt with uh, that. Uh, the night uh, I was out with that particular division, which I uh, can still recall with some detail. Um, the number of incidents was actually very few and far between. And when we went back to the, uh, to the police headquarters for the briefing after uh, the incident, after the evening, uh, to look at how they had handled various incidents and review what had gone on uh, and discuss also where they knew there were flashpoints and where there weren't flashpoints, it was interesting to reflect on the statistics as to the number of incidents that uh, did take place. So uh, nothing changes in, uh, in some ways in Scotland. We're, we're still dealing with these things. I noticed the, Minister, the Cabinet Secretary's um, opening remarks in terms of making um, an over-provision assessment across an entire board area. It strikes me just in passing that will create some very significant 
significant issues uh, indeed, and I'm sure the committee will reflect on that at uh, uh, stage two. Certainly the trade will, uh, because I recall uh, some of that debate from some years uh, back uh, as well. I have some sympathy with the argument that Dalek Rowley forwarded as well, presiding officer, in relation to this being, in effect, a consolidated bill. Um, I seem to recall Westminster always being criticised for producing consolidated Scotland bills. Uh, we seem to do quite a lot of that in Edinburgh nowadays. Uh, but, and I do think there is some merit in the argument that a number of uh, members across the chamber have forwarded uh, to say that on something uh, as clear-cut as air weapons, uh, that constituted a piece of legislation in its own right. Uh, the aspects of licensing that the Cabinet Secretary introduced clearly do have a, uh, a common uh, theme uh, and a common uh, area of uh, responsibility. Uh, and it may, it may have been uh, tidier legislation uh, to have dealt with them in that way, not least of which for the reasons that uh, Mr Rowley uh, gave. There are, there, are, there are arguments about the length of some of the regimes that have been in place and how those should be uh, assessed assessed in uh, this time that we're now uh, in. I want to just make a couple of uh, remarks, uh, from, particularly from a rural perspective, uh, on the licensing proposals on uh, air uh, weapons. I don't think anyone disputes uh, that there are problems with the ownership and inappropriate use of, of air uh, guns. Uh, I do believe, uh, and the evidence uh, uh, supports this, that there is uh, a greater number of incidents in urban Scotland than in rural and island areas. But in justifying the Bill's proposals in this area, the current and indeed the previous Justice Secretary have uh, quite rightly mentioned well-publicised incidents where young children have been hurt by the completely wrong use uh, of an air gun. These cases uh, are appalling uh, and have been rightly uh, condemned, but they've also been prosecuted through the laws of Scotland that we already have, and I think that point has to be uh, borne in mind. Now, the question, therefore, is whether the introduction of blanket restrictions across the board that is now being proposed will have a significant impact on the individuals and practices that currently present absolutely no risk whatsoever to public safety. And I do think that's a, a fact uh, that should be taken into account in considering this carefully. Uh, nor will these measures, as I understand them, provide much, if indeed any, deterrent, presiding officer, for those intent on acting irresponsibly. Now, the Cabinet Secretary might well say that applies to many things, and he would be right. But I do think uh, when the words proportionality get banded around, as we always band them around in these kind of debates, there's some requirement on all of us to make a judgment about these things and not just jump to the highest or lowest common denominator, depending on how you see the particular argument. There's also a greater risk, I think, for government in, in the context of the uh, regime around um, licensing, and that is, as I understand it from experts, that low-powered air guns would be at a higher level of restriction than double-barreled 12-bore shotguns and even smooth-bore cannon. Now, uh, I do not argue that this, there will suddenly be an upsurge in the use of such uh, cannon, but this bill does provide, as I think the evidence to the committee and uh, it, to members uh, has uh, come across in recent days, it does provide for an argument allowing a trade-up to more powerful uh, weapons, and that would be a perverse and bad outcome, not one I'm sure the government wants, certainly not one that I want either. I totally appreciate that the government is under pressure to act. Ministers are always under pressure to do something in the context of an incident, particularly if it's, um, if it's absolutely tragic, which has, of course, happened in the past. But government's also about a hard assessment of alternatives. And I would urge um, the Cabinet Secretary to consider two things. Um, first, that uh, he mentioned, I'm not sure if he mentioned, but certainly other colleagues have mentioned that there are it's thought to be 500,000 air guns across Scotland. Uh, an amnesty would take an awful lot of those right out of uh, circulation. Claire, Ar Claire Adamson, who is no longer in her place, but was quite right when she said uh, that she's got uh, her, her family still got one in the family loft in her house. I'm sure there are many, many cases of that across Scotland. Uh, and I would argue, as with other uh, uh, other sets of circumstances that uh, an amnesty would be uh, a positive way in which to reduce the sheer number that are currently uh present in Scotland. Secondly, I will strongly advocate also the educating of young people about firearms. I see what games uh, on, on uh, Playstations and online my boys play. They invariably involve guns. At the moment, our news, our national news, is not just dominated by politics, but is also dominated by uh, um, uh, people drowning in the Mediterranean who are escaping from Libya. Libya is a place at the moment where there is no rule of law. There is the rule of the gun. And there can be no doubt that young people are influenced 
by uh, what they see on television, how that's being reported, and what they read online uh, as well. So parents, and it is absolutely also about parents and schools, uh, in my view, have a responsibility to talk about guns and the reality of what they can mean uh, as well. Now, the government are rightly concerned by public safety. Uh, the crime statistics suggest, of course, that incidents involving air weapons are small and are falling. Uh, the evidence to the committee uh, was very clear on that. I could contrast that, as some have, with knife crime, which runs at significantly higher levels. Now, no one is suggesting that suddenly we license the kitchen knife. That would be plainly ludicrous, presiding officer. Yet buying a, any kind of blade is easier. But as uh, Crofter put it to me in Shetland the other day, there are more murders with a knife crime than will ever happen with an air gun. And that is uh, the proportionality argument, proportional argument that I would ask the government to bear in mind when it's introducing this licensing law. Thank you. And thank you very much. Now, Colin Sander White to be followed by Jane Baxter. Six minutes are thereby, please. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the committee for their scrutiny of this bill and the attention they've paid to all the evidence submitted, uh, my own included, and what undoubtedly has been, I think, an arduous and sometimes emotional uh, you know, task, taking evidence on air weapons, alcohol supply, taxis, licences, metal theft and uh, sexual entertainment venues and I also want to thank the clerks uh, for the work they have carried out during this process both the committee and uh, for myself also. Presiding officer I'm not a member of the committee but I have for many years taken an interest in the sexual entertainment industry and the effects this has on women and girls and the perception of the wider public uh, particularly men to women through uh, exploitation and I do welcome the inclusion of regulation of venues offering sexual entertainment such as lap dancing clubs. Uh, presiding officer, in 2005, the previous government, and uh, Tavi Scott was just alluding to the fact that he was a, uh, a cab sec in that particular government, uh, set up a working group on adult entertainment following concerns expressed about lack of controls on adult entertainment activity. Now, the working group recommended that sexual entertainment should be regulated. However, the regulation was not taken forward. And in 2010, I took forward an amendment to Criminal Justice and Licensing Act, which was supported by the Scottish Government. Government at stage three uh, of that bill, but it was not agreed by the Parliament at that time. Now, to say I was disappointed is an understatement, uh, but undeterred, as most folk know, I have continued to pursue this particular issue, and I do thank the Scottish Government for incorporating my amendment, which was in 2010 and, and worked on, into this particular bill, and I do welcome the local government's comments in regards to this and other issues in the bill. Uh, I really am pleased that this type of so-called entertainment is to be regulated and uh, licensed. And uh, Mary Miller of Glasgow City Council said, and I couldn't put it better myself, she said, it strikes me that we have licensing legislation and regulations to cover everything from window cleaning to selling burgers from a van or selling chewing gum at three o'clock in the morning under late hours catering regulations but adult entertainment activity is currently not regulated. So I think it's high time it was regulated, and I do uh, thank it on that as well. Now, I'm just thinking about some of the things that's been said by uh, the other members, and I, I was struck by some of the examples that were given in regards to licensing uh, adult entertainment. And I do want to give a couple of examples myself. Uh, the example of the lady in Edinburgh, not far from here, who actually works in one of these venues, who else wasn't working in the venue with a child was walking along the street and was attacked by someone who had been a customer in one of these venues, uh, costed and attacked. Uh, and that, you know, to me, that is absolutely disgraceful. Going about a local business, what does it say about these venues? And then you have the other issue where uh, women had contacted me from corporate businesses, where basically promotion was denied to them because during this corporate business they had corporate clients who would fly in or come up from other areas and they were expected to take them to these so-called sexual entertainment uh, premises. And if they refused to do so, they saw the promotion uh, chances fall. So there, there's different areas here, and I think it's really good that we do absolutely have to look at the fact that these do have to be regulated, not just for the, for the sake of how women are perceived, and that's been very well said by some of the members on the other benches. The fact as well that uh, it's not good for businesses, as Elaine Murray has said, that you would have, you know, good for business, you have these types of entertainment venues. Facts of the matter, women are even being discriminated in the corporate businesses because they will not take clients to that. And I think that's really quite uh, disgraceful. 
If I could turn to some of the recommendations that have been mentioned in the committee's report, particularly that of an appropriate number of sexual entertainments and the uh, discretionary or mandatory regimes. Now, I do welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to ensure that guidance is given, and I note that's in the report and recommendations also from the committee, uh, given to licensing authorities on the, uh, the issue of the appropriate numbers, and that is to be welcomed. I also note the committee's recommendation to make sexual entertainment venues licensing mandatory. Uh, however, my original amendment, that which is in the bill from the, the Scottish Government, was for an opt-in piece of legislation, because it is a fact there's only four or five local authorities which actually operate these entertainment licences. And I wonder, you know, obviously... The Scottish Government put forward that they think that is enough, that it is an opt-in and a choice by local authorities. And I do agree with Elaine Murray when she mentioned the fact that local authorities are the best place people to take the decision on just how many licences they should have in their areas. Now, there are a couple of issues which were raised by other members as well. The issue of under-18-year-olds working in these clubs. I don't know what kind of work they would be doing. I don't know if... Uh, it would be against EU regulations if you stop people from 16 to 18 being able to work as a cleaner or whatever it may be. I really don't know, and I think I would like that to actually be looked at because some of the issues that have been raised, yes, it's, it's the people that hang about these clubs as well, either in the working hours or not in the working hours. And another issue I did want to raise was that of a fit and proper person. Uh, you know, I think these two issues in particular should be looked at. On the recommendation of a single body to deal with the SEVs, we'll call it alcohol and advertising, you know, I would be worried if we were going down that road that it might take a longer time to put forward if we were bringing forward a new regulatory body. And that would worry me that basically it would take longer to legislate in this field. Now, I think we've waited long enough for legislation in this field to tackle the issue of sexual entertainment, uh, which so objectifies women. And that's one of the areas where I do have concerns if we had to go down that road, would everything be thrown out and we need to start again? So perhaps uh, your Cabinet Secretary could pick up on that or we'd look at it at uh, stage two of the bill. But certainly, I think uh, it's a move forward. I hope uh, everyone's said that they support the bill and I really do think it, hope it goes through in stage two and stage three. We must be basically make sure women are not objectified anymore by this so-called form of sexual entertainment. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I now call on Jean Baxter to be followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> this is a wide-ranging and far-reaching bill. It is important that it is subject to close and scrupulous scrutiny in this Parliament. The scale of the bill's ambition, however, does lead me to believe that it would have been better if it had been divided into smaller parts in order to ensure that each area is scrutinised as closely as possible. The provisions contained within this single bill could easily have formed a larger part of several bills. So I think it's worth noting at the outset that in future the Scottish Government issues of this that in future the Scottish Government, when it's considering issues of a significance, should do it in discrete bills in order to ensure that this Parliament's legislation is as robust and effective as it can possibly be. Firstly, the licensing of the owners of air weapons is of course a hugely important topic. I'm sure that each of us can recall the tragic cases that have been in the news over the years where air weapons have led to deaths and serious injuries. The approach adopted in this bill is therefore to be broadly supported. It is important that we keep in mind that there are some, albeit very limited, reasons for people to own and use air weapons. Shooting sports are as legitimate as any other, and we should avoid stigmatising people who choose to participate in them. We must, however, remember that air weapons are weapons. We cannot allow further tragedies to take place across Scotland involving air weapons. And I'm pleased that there is cross-party agreement on this topic, or at least there was until the debate today. But um, I hope that we can get back to cross-party agreement on this topic. As the committee has noted, it is important that there is a well-funded and implemented publicity campaign across the country to ensure that all those affected by the changes contained in this long and fairly technical legislation are aware of the implications of the new regime. Many people may only own an air weapon and no other form of firearm and therefore be unaware of the conditions for applying for and holding a firearm certificate. Moving on to the regulation of adult entertainment venues, I think we would all agree that the current regime in place regarding such venues is inadequate. The question central to this bill is whether it goes far enough. 
I agree entirely with the principle of leaving the last word on whether an adult entertainment venue receives a licence that that should fall to local authorities. As a former local councillor, I believe it is important that democratic accountability on a ward level, combined with councillors' experience in making various quasi-judicial decisions, is utilised in relation to such venues. Local authorities can currently decide only whether an adult entertainment venue is permitted a licence for the provision of alcohol. It is only proper that local authorities are empowered to evaluate whether such venues should be allowed in the first place. And I would endorse Elaine Murray's comments earlier about extending that to other sorts of venues like betting shops and perhaps payday loan shops. There are those who would like this legislation to go much further. I believe that in future stages of this bill, those voices should be heard. This is an important moral question and we should strive to ensure that those with strong feelings on the topic are able to put their case forward. We should also examine the apparent loophole regarding holding fewer than four events of an adult nature a year. If the legislation could be circumvented with such ease, then it's hardly worth implementing in the first place. This brings me to the question of the changes proposed in this bill relating to alcohol licensing. The abuse of alcohol is an enormous problem right across the country. Scottish Government-funded research has estimated the cost of alcohol misuse to Scotland to be somewhere between 2,883 million and 5,396 million per year. It is imperative, therefore, that our licensing scheme is appropriate, robust and effective. This bill seeks to amend fairly old legislation. I think it would have been preferable for the Scottish Government to put forward a less piecemeal and more fundamental set of reforms for alcohol licensing in Scotland. We should look more broadly at how effective the current regime is across the country. I think that future governments will have to examine this issue in a more fundamental way sooner or later. The remainder of the bill deals with a series of highly specific forms of licensing. I return to my previous point that this bill is far too broad for us to provide proper scrutiny to all of its provisions, but I will briefly mention two key elements of the remainder of the bill. The taxi licensing scheme has always been predicated on the idea that taxis have a significant business advantage as they are able to accept bookings on the spot. However, this benefit, this benefit has been reduced by the near universal use of mobile phones. It is widely accepted that most journeys of this nature are now pre-booked. It appears that this trend is set to continue with the advent of taxi booking mobile phone apps. These technological advances question the entire approach adopted in relation to the licensing of taxis in Scotland. Recognising this, however, we can still say that the specific provisions contained in this bill are acceptable and should be approved by the Parliament. In relation to the changes regarding the regulation of scrap metal dealing, the changes proposed also seem sensible. They are very similar to the approach adopted in England, which seems to work well. With this in mind, I see no reason to oppose the changes proposed by this bill. All in all, this bill seems acceptable in principle. As it is technical and applies to many specialist groups, it is important that the Scottish Government listens closely to the concerns and advice of experts in the relevant fields, campaigners and businesses affected by the proposed changes. The Law Society of Scotland in particular has raised several concerns regarding various aspects of this legislation. The Scottish Government should pay close attention to these concerns and amend the legislation accordingly. The Bill de deals with several key topics. It is important that we get the level of regulation right on them. Additionally, it is important that we ensure that when such questions are considered in the future, that we are able to consider them in greater detail and, where appropriate, in separate legislation. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Willie Coffey to be followed by Rhoda Grant. <coughs> thanks very much, President Officer. Along with our convener and other members who have spoken so far, I would like to add my thanks to the many people and organisations who took the time to offer their views and give evidence to us. And to our committee clerking team, of course, who have done a great job in putting the committee's report together. Um, the purpose of any licensing system is, of course, to regulate legal activities which have a potential to cause harm to those individuals engaging in those activities and to the wider public who might be affected by them. In this case, the use of air weapons and licensing as it relates to taxis, metal dealers and various public entertainment activities. The bill makes it an offence to possess, purchase or acquire an air weapon without holding a certificate rather than regulating ownership itself. If an offence is committed, it is more about who committed the offence rather than who owns the weapon used. In relation to air weapons, I was pleased to see that the Government has accepted the Committee's first recommendations in supporting a public information campaign to give the public the information they need in advance of any certification system that is coming into place. 
a website and other social media tools will give, give people information about how to hand in unwanted weapons, the certification process itself, and right through to how they might wish to dispose of a weapon under the new scheme, along with all the appropriate information on fees and timescales involved too. I think that will be a very important part of engaging with the owners and clubs and will also serve the wider public interest as well. The committee also wanted to ensure that the bill did not prevent remote sales outside Scotland to people who live elsewhere and that recommendation too has been accepted by the government and I understand an amendment at stage two will facilitate this. It simply means that an air weapon can be bought in Scotland and delivered to a registered firearms dealer in England or Wales for collection. The issue of whether to introduce an air weapon marking and identification system was discussed at some length at the committee, but I see from the government's response to this that neither they, Police Scotland or the Gun Trade Association think that it's really necessary. There is other legislation in place to deal with criminality involving weapons, and having the mark system would not be critical in helping to prove a case that might be brought to court. It's quite a detailed explanation from the government and hopefully clarifies this particular issue. On the alcohol licensing proposals, one of the key proposals is the creation of a new offence of supplying alcohol to young people for consumption in a public place. Members will know that while it's currently illegal to buy alcohol on behalf of a child, it's not illegal to buy alcohol to share with a child. And the bill will close this loophole by making it an offence for a person aged 18 or over to share alcohol with a person under 18 in a public place. That includes private property, where drinkers might have accessed it illegally. The purpose there, of course, is to help us tackle outdoor drinking by children and young people, and the proposal has widespread support. I note also the government's intention to consider the reintroduction of a fit and proper person test for a person to hold an alcohol licence at stage two. While there was agreement amongst some of those giving evidence to the committee, there were some reservations about it, mainly about linking the test to the broader licensing objectives, perhaps giving rise to further litigation. So perhaps stage two will help us resolve this issue one way or the other. There are a few recommendations there that I think strengthen the desire for local boards to consult the public health boards and alcohol and drug partnerships on a whole variety of issues relating to alcohol. The more informed our boards are, hopefully the better decisions they will take. And these sections in the report, supported by the government again, are more about reminding everyone that there is some good experience out there and data to be shared before decisions are ultimately taken. On the taxi licensing aspect of the bill, I would like to make two points. One relates to the issue of a taxi driver who may be the subject of numerous complaints in one authority, then seeking to obtain a license in another authority and, of course, forgetting to reveal that he has been the subject of such complaints. The response from the government says that authorities can already make such inquiries and that Police Scotland, as a single entity now, should be able to assist. But my view is that Police Scotland may not actually have such data recorded. I feel that in order to enhance the protection of the public who use taxis, particularly vulnerable young women, there has to be more than an expectation that authorities should try to find out from a neighbouring authority about any complaints made about an applicant. There needs to be a Scotland-wide response to this issue. Authorities should record all such complaints which the other authorities can easily access. I think that anything less than this does nothing to reduce the risk. On the less controversial issue about knowledge, I support the committee's view that the knowledge test should apply to all drivers, regardless of whether it's a taxi or a private car hire. The public expect, when they get into a car, to be taken somewhere that the driver actually knows where he's going. I had the unfortunate experience a few years ago when a private taxi driver in Edinburgh didn't have a clue where Hibernian's Easter Road football stadium was. I hope any guidance notes issued on this by the government will strongly encourage the knowledge test to be adopted across the board. In summary, President Officer, the Air Weapons and Licensing Bill, with its many provisions, will, in my view, strengthen public safety in Scotland and provide opportunities 
for the public and Civic Scotland to engage with the local licensing boards on these very important issues. And I'm happy to support the general principles of this bill at stage one. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Rhoda Grant to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. A fairly generous six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to speak specifically about Section 68 of the Bill that introduces a licensing regime for sexual entertainment venues such as lap dancing clubs. Um, I'd also like to pay tribute to the work Sandra White's done on this issue over the years, um, and I'm sure she's very pleased that this is now coming forward. This became an issue in Inverness, eh, where the licensing committee said they were powerless to stop a licence being granted to a lap dancing club in the city despite the Violence Against Women Partnership warning of the impact that that would have on the area. Therefore, I welcome the move to empower local authorities to stop such clubs opening in our towns and cities. That said, the Scottish Government's Violence Against Women and Girls strategy, equally safe, recognises that commercial sexual exploitation, including stripping, lap dancing, pole dancing, is violence against women. They tell us these activities have been shown to be harmful for individual women involved and have a negative impact on the position of all women through the objectif objectification of women's bodies. It therefore seems a little perverse that we are licensing venues that perpetrate violence against women. My preferred option would be that we ban all such venues from our country and seek to create an equal society where women are valued and not sold as commodities. That said, the proposed licensing regime is better than the current situation where licensing committees feel powerless to stop them. Zero Tolerance tells us that there is no place for a highly gendered form of sexual entertainment in Scotland. In their briefing, they say these venues are places where men often seek to buy sex. This means that women are often moved from sexualised entertainment into prostitution. They also encourage gender inequality, which impacts on all women and indeed our whole society. If we are to live in an equal society, we have to stop such venues operating because they treat women as commodities to be sold for the sexual pleasure of men. They are not normal entertainment venues. Other countries have none, for example, Iceland. And the countries that will not tolerate such forms of entertainment tend to give gender equality a much higher priority. The licensing regime must be mandatory. Every venue, regardless of how often they're providing adult entertainment, should be subject to it. Local authorities must carry out equalities impact assessments on these venues before issuing licenses, taking into account their impact on wider society and their local area. I would also wish to see Violence Against Women partnerships being statutory consultees when licences are applied for. Local communities must have a say on whether those licences are granted and local authorities must be allowed to have a policy of no venues at all in their area. Other speakers have talked about the bill allowing young people under the age of 18 to work in these venues at times when sexual entertainment is not taking place. However, there are often pornographic images in these premises which children working there would have access to. And again, Zero Tolerance warns us of the implication of allowing young people to work in that environment. And they tell us that this, in essence, creates a groomer's charter. It would also normalise such entertainment and exploitation in the eyes of very young and vulnerable people working there. Young girls would also be vulnerable to being enticed to become sexual entertainers when they turned 18. Any young person working there would be at risk of developing unhealthy attitudes to sexual relationships. <coughs> Excuse me, presiding officer. I believe the bill must be amended to protect young people from the exploitative nature of these premises. The committee received a submission from Child's Eyes UK um, regarding the public, public display of sexualised images to children, and I believe they have a point, and I think it was a point well made by Cara Hilton. Such images should not be on display publicly. We have the power and do, and are proposing to, um, ban the display of cigarettes because they're dangerous and harmful and so are those images and how they impact on gender violence and inequality. 
The bill provides an opportunity to do this, and I hope that the government will give it due consideration. The bill doesn't either have a fit and proper test for a licensee of a sexual entertainment venue, while those applying for liquor licences are subject to that test. It's surely an oversight, and I hope the bill will be amended to change this anomaly. Licensing must also ensure that employment law is adhered to. Women who work in these venues are often charged appearance fees and can also be fined, meaning that they can end up earning little or nothing at all. We all agree that we should be implementing the living wage, that we should not be promoting zero hours uh, contracts and that we should be protecting workers. And therefore, if we allow those venues to operate, we need to make sure that they are working within the, the law, that those working in them are treated and paid properly. And this, again, can be addressed through the licensing regime. I firmly believe that these sexual entertainment venues have no place in a modern equal society and we should be banning them rather than licensing them. However, this is a step in the right direction and I hope that all local authorities will take the opportunity to refuse all licences in their areas. Many thanks. I now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by John Wilson. A generous six minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And before starting, uh, I think it would be appropriate to uh, uh, report that I am a member of the Banff Town and County Club, uh, which is a, a licensed uh, premises uh, that's referred to in this Act. I'm not intending to speak on that part of the Act, but uh, it's appropriate that I say that. Um, interesting debate. Um, one of the things perhaps we ought to think about is that the problem of alcohol abuse and licensing and controlling alcohol is hardly something that's new. Uh, Christopher Smout, the renowned uh, historian who, who wrote the book The Scots, 1830 to 1950, uh, he's essentially a social historian, uh, spoke of a village in East Lothian uh, which had one uh, public house for every 14 occupants. Now, special circumstances because it was a village where many people came seasonally uh, to, uh, to work in the agricultural industry. So it's not exactly a new problem. It was also a problem when the Immature Spirits Act of 1915 uh, was brought forward. I have a personal interest in that because my father's cousin was responsible for that act. Uh, Lloyd George had wanted to ban uh, the sale of alcohol altogether. Uh, because of the effect alcohol had on the munitions factories in the military towns around the UK during the First War. And James Stevenson uh, persuaded them that it might be more effective uh, to, uh, to, to simply have a prohibition uh, for immature spirits uh, being sold. And that's why whisky is kept in bond for three years. It wasn't to improve the quality of whisky, although it had that secondary effect. It was to restrict the supply because there was seen to be an issue uh, at that time. And of course, the improvement of the brand uh, that is Scotch whisky that flowed from that act was an incidental benefit to whisky because it meant that whisky no longer had any poor quality stuff in the market and could be trusted as a quality brand. Now we can move forward to the reforms of the 1960s. Uh, up to that point, uh, licensing has gotten one or two things we've totally forgotten about. Um, in that, for example, we had the veto poll. Uh, which Teddy Taylor, who was the Tory MP for Cathcart for many years, was a very strong exponent of. And Cathcart, I think, subject to confirmation, uh, was the last area in Glasgow where there was a total veto because the population had requisitioned a poll under the requisite legislation and voted to have no licensed premises in their area. And that was the provision that uh, it was the case after the war and up to the reform uh, in uh, the early 60s. In addition, if you wanted a license for a Sunday, um, it had to be in a hotel. And the definition of a hotel meant that if you were going to sell drink on a Sunday, you had to have somebody resident in the hotel. And so across Scotland, you had hotels which advertised seven-day licenses who actually had one room in there where somebody lived permanently at a discounted rate so that their license was not discounted. And I, I, I happen to know one of the poor unfortunate, now deceased, called John Dalrymple, who got thrown out of his home that he'd lived in for 30 years uh, when we reformed the legislation in the 1960s. So 
We should not imagine that any generation of politicians has been able to identify all the perfect solutions to what's a quite a substantial problem. Now, I'm going to admit to you uh, personally that I uh, first entered a pub and consumed drink on the 21st of March, 1959. Um, it was the register tap in Edinburgh um, after a 3-3 uh, draw in the Calcutta Cup at Murrayfield, there was a need for consolation you will probably have been able to work out I may not have been fully of age. And the barman did ask me to sit behind the door in case a policeman uh, popped his head round the door. Things were a lot more lax in the old days. I think the provisions that we're looking at now in taking things forward are much better. And my grandfather, of course, wouldn't have approved at all because he was a member of the Society of Rechabites who went around trying to get people to sign the pledge. He was against drinking in all its forms. Now, in relation to air guns, I used to have an air gun when I was a kid. It wasn't the kind of air gun you can get now. It, it, it struggled to propel its 0.177 millimeter uh, lead pellet more than about 30 feet. Um, the guns we have now are more significant. And of course, if I wanted to carry it in a public place, I needed a license. But that was simply a question of going to the post office, handing over 10 bob and getting a license. Uh, I think it really was just a way of recording uh, who had, had these licenses and seemed utterly pointless. Uh, in uh, my concluding remarks, I want to just uh, commend the policy position that Cara Hilton has taken. I had enormous sympathy uh, for what she expressed in relation to the sexualization of the female image. I absolutely agree. But I do caution, because she appeared to suggest that she would bring forward um, amendments at stage two uh, to deal with uh, the, on the media and on the internet. That, of course, is not within the powers that we have in this parliament. And I just thought it would be useful to just spell out why that's a risky thing to do. Um, when bills come forward, the presiding officer's office has to say that they are intra varies, in other words, within the powers of the parliament. Um, as amendments come forward at stage two, it's up to the convener of the committee to come to a view, and at stage three, again, uh, it's up to uh, the presiding officer to select amendments or not. But, of course, we can pass legislation that is ultra varies. That's possible to do. However, when it goes for royal assent, if it is judged by the legal advisers to the palace, uh, to be ultra varies, royal assent will not be given. So it isn't simply a matter of the little bit of the bill that is ultra varies being struck out, although it could be at a later date if there's a dispute, it could cause the whole bill to fall. So I simply advise, while utterly, utterly sympathising and agreeing with what's been said, and by Rhoda Grant as well, by the way, and, and, and others, I, there is no policy difference between any of us, um, that, that we, we need to be very, very careful to take very good advice. And if we get good advice and the legal advice is we can do it, I'm utterly content and I will be behind uh, any such amendments. But we need to be very, uh, very careful on these matters. Finally, presiding officer, I think it is only appropriate that I record our gratitude to Sandra White uh, for the work that she has undertaken in relation to sexual entertainment venues over a significant period of time. She's not been the only person articulating the argument, but I think she's been the one who's utterly stuck with it. And it is to her eternal credit that in the bill that we see before us today, we see Sandra not inconsiderably small and writ large in the effects that are before us. And I wish uh, this bill every success as it passes through subsequent stages in Parliament. Presiding officer. Many thanks. Many thanks. Now I call on John Wilson. Generous six minutes. Thank you very much, presiding officer. I come to this debate as the deputy convener of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee and sat through many evidence sessions in the committee, and I'd like to pay tribute to those witnesses who came forward, but also to those who, and many uh, individuals who made submissions to the committee while we were considering this stage one of the bill. And like other members, I would like to take the bill in the sections uh, that I think are of importance, not to say that every section of the bill isn't important. But in terms of the air weapons section of the bill, which the, the bill lends its name to, uh, we only had this, this parliament only had the powers uh, following the transfer of section 10 of the Scotland Act 2012 uh, to carry, carry out legal competence in this area. 
And for me, that took too long to actually give this Parliament that legal competence. The other issue that arises out of this debate, uh, presiding officer, is the issue about we, when we talk about air weapons, we are not talking about all air weapons. We do not have the competence to license all air weapons. There are still air weapons that are held and will be licensed, continue to be licensed by the UK government. And these weapons are weapons that are defined as the, a handgun that can fire above six pounds per square foot and uh, rifles that can actually uh, discharge at 12, pounds, 12 foot pounds. Uh, and really the issue for us is to make clear when we are rolling out this legislation, when it does become an act, that individuals are aware of the distinction and the differences that exist in relation to air weapons, that where they are seen to be especially dangerous, they will still come under Westminster jurisdiction, and it's only the air weapons without below those limits uh, that we will actually have the right to have any uh, regulation and any legislation on and be responsible for the licensing. We've also got to be, bear in mind in terms of the legislation that we, when we talked in committee about the licensing and the cost of licensing uh, the individual, not the weapon, as I think the convener quite rightly said, we are not licensing weapons. While firearms and shotguns are registered because they have registration marks, air weapons do not have registration marks, and the, registr the license holder has got to register uh, firearms and shotguns against that certificate in relation to the licensing regime we're talking about here at the present moment is, it, is the individual uh, that will be licensed, not the air weapon that they hold. Uh, in terms of the fees that have been suggested, there have been some uh, discussion about what the charge would be to license uh, or become a license holder. Uh, and we've got to bear in mind that at the present moment, a firearm or shotgun license fee currently sits at £50. Uh, and the, I know Westminster are currently considering that, and um, I'm sure they will come back to that after May the 7th. But at the present moment, the figures that are being quoted for a firearm is £88 and a shotgun £79.50. Now, we've got to bear that in mind when we're talking about the potential full-cost recovery of a licensing regime for air weapons. And we've got to, uh, as Tavis Scott mentioned in his contribution, not encourage individuals to look at the cost of licensing an air weapon at potentially £80 when they could actually apply for a shotgun licence at £79.50 or £88 for a firearm. So the trading up debate is there for individuals who may have and may be deemed to be appropriate to hold a licence actually doing that, trading up to hold a firearm and a shotgun rather than uh, currently holding an air weapon. And I think uh, the comments have been made by a number of members where the estimated 500,000 air weapons are currently located in households throughout Scotland is one that we really need to try and address uh, and try and find a way of reducing that number, but if not reducing that number, finding a way that doesn't clash as the Police Scotland have indicated, with the peaks and troughs of the firearms and shotgun licensing that's currently taking place uh, with the air weapons licensing. Because what we would hate to see is a situation where the introduction of air weapons licensing comes in at the peak of the licensing uh, period for shotguns and uh, firearms, because we, we have that, uh, and clearly in evidence from the Police Scotland indicated there were peaks and troughs in terms of the licensing of those uh, firearms and shotguns. So it's really uh, those issues that we really need to try and address. And I welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary taking on board a number of the issues that the committee had raised in terms of their weapons. Uh, the issue in relation to other aspects of this legislation and, and some of the adult ed entertainment venues licensing, has, I think, has been covered uh, adequately by a number of members. And I have welcome the opportunity to consider the amendments that will be coming forward uh, with, with very much with interest in terms of the uh, proposals that will be put forward to the committee. But I would like to talk about the scrap metal dealers, uh, the presiding officer, because I think there is an issue. Other members have mentioned the, the factors, the risks that scrap metal dealers 
uh, or the scrap metals, the people who steal scrap metal to sell on, uh, pose in terms of life and health for individuals. Now, we looked at the fines that were imposed, and the convener mentioned the £5,000 fine that can be imposed on somebody caught stealing scrap metal. The difficulty is, is the co overall cost of uh, the damage that's done by some of the thefts that take place. And we heard the evidence from one of the power companies who indicated they estimated it could be in the region of £40 million a, a year or over a period of time as the overall cost to that power company, not including the cost to the individual householders and communities because of the damage that's been done. And the maximum fine at the present moment is only £5,000. And I think it would be appropriate to make the fines or the uh, penalties commensurate with the damage, the overall damage that's being caused by these uh, thefts. And Claire Adamson mentioned the Ockengief miner that was stolen, and I was there at the unveiling with the First Minister and other members of this chamber. And fortunately for that community, the sculptor had uh, not destroyed the mould that had uh, produced the sculpture, and so therefore he was able to replace the sculpture, and we actually had a, another unveiling of that sculpture. But the difficulty is that for many communities throughout Scotland, they don't have that opportunity when the theft West takes George place now, uh, because they don't have the original moulds and they can't re reproduce uh, the sculptures and other uh, materials that have been stolen. So, presiding officer, I think we've started the process and hopefully as a committee, when we consider the stage two amendments, we can get to a piece of legislation that will be not only meaningful, but also I would like to encourage be future-proofed against other developments, because there are other issues about taxis, private hire cars, apps, and various other things that need to be considered Thanks as we much. move forward. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. Now, Colin, we move to closing speeches. Now, Colin, Alex Ferguson, up to seven minutes. Please, Mr Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm happy to be concluding this debate for the Scottish Conservatives, although, like other members, I'm, I'm not a member of any of the committees that have been involved. But I have to say I do find myself somewhat perplexed by the bill and its general principles that we've been debating this afternoon. There is, as Cameron Buchanan detailed in his opening contribution, a great deal within this bill that we very much welcome, even if we believe that some parts may require modest amendment at later stages. I particularly welcome part two on the alcohol licensing for initiative. I know that's something that's close to your own heart, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I welcome the, uh, the section of the bill that deals with, with um, scrap metal licensing as well. But we have a real sticking point when it comes to the government's proposals on air weapon licensing. And uh, it is on that aspect of the bill that I want to concentrate because it is the single reason that we are unable to fully support the general principles at decision time. I dearly wish, as Alex Rowley and Tavis Scott, I think, both mentioned, that this part had been in a separate bill. But we are where we are on that front. And I want to make one thing really clear at the outset. Whatever our views on this part of the bill, gun crime, any gun crime, is utterly abhorrent, whether it be against property, against human, against pet, against wild animal or bird. And I think that is something I'm sure that this whole chamber can agree on. And we will always, on these benches, support the robust enforcement of existing and additional legislation where there is an unequivocal evidence base that it will be effective in achieving its aims. But I cannot find evidence in this instance that that will be the case. Let's, forget, let's not forget, as has been mentioned, that between 2006 and 2007, when there were 683 reported offences involving air weapons, and 2012-13, when there were 171, there's been a drop of 75% in reported incidents involving air weapons. 2007 was, I think, the year that Colin Keir mentioned, which mirrored a debate of this nature, and he suggested the Conservatives' position hasn't moved. That's not true, because on the basis of those figures, our position has actually hardened, because it seems to me that a drop of 75% is quite significant. In fact, that is a significant reduction in anybody's language, and it is presumably the result of successful implementation of existing legislation and also of increased educational initiatives by both the Scottish Government and shooting organisations on which they are to be commended. Proof if proof were needed, presiding officer, that uh, the carrot often works better than the stick, but on occasions like this they can also work well together. 
On the subject of annual figures, I, I am concerned, I, I made an intervention earlier to raise this concern, that the most recent air weapon offence statistics for 2013-14 are not available. They should have been published in November 2014, but apparently due to difficulties in collating the data, they won't now be published until October this year, almost a year late and too late certainly to be included in this debate. A cynic, not me, but a cynic, might wonder why they cannot be produced by Police Scotland this year, while this bill is under consideration, when they have been regularly, when they've been regularly produced in, in, in recent years, especially as Police Scotland, I will give away in a moment, were apparently able to quote figures from April to July 2014 in evidence. It seems to me that something's not quite right there, presiding officer, and it doesn't do this debate any favours. I give way to Kevin Stewart. I, I thank Mr Stewart. Ferguson for giving way, and obviously he's pointed out that we have moved to a, a new regime in terms of Police Scotland instead of the previous eight forces. Um, Mr Ferguson said right at the very start that he would support a separate bill, um, but not this one which uh, is joined together. What would be different in that separate bill from the proposed legislation on air weapons uh, in this bill that would make you support that one, but not this one? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I think I'm being misquoted because I didn't say I'd support a separate bill. I said there should be a separate bill because what, what, I, what, what I don't like about this aggregated bill is that at the end of the day, if the sticking point remains in place, we will have to vote against this bill. And that would be, I think, a great pity when there is so much of it that we believe is good. If it had been a separate bill, we could have disassociated ourselves from the part we disagree with, but supported the part that we do agree with. Whatever the figures that are not available turn out to be, there is no evidence at all that I can find that a licensing system will reduce crime. Indeed, if the possession of an air gun without a licence becomes a crime, as it will, uh, this bill can only increase the crime statistics, surely the very opposite of what the government intends. And then we come to the issue of the... Pra um, if I have time, presiding officer, I do. Yes, indeed. Stuart Stevenson. Um, may, I, may I suggest to the member no one cares about the statistics, up or down. What we care about is what happens on the ground in improving public safety. Let's focus. And the point I'm trying to make is that I can't find anything in this regime that will improve public safety, and I'll come back to that later. Mr Stevenson's intervention has brilliantly made me lose my place into where I was. But we come to the issues of the, which is, is well timed, Mr Stevenson. But we come now, if I may, come to the issue of the practicalities of introducing the licence. Um, the British Association of Shooting and Conservation, and indeed other shooting organisations on whose behalf it was speaking, have pointed out that it can take up to nine months to process a shotgun or firearms licence at the moment. Police Scotland are in the process of reducing the number of civilian licensing officers from 34 to 14, and they're training up police officers who will presumably be taken off the beat in order to fill that gap. Their task will then be to cope with the demand of the owners of some 500,000 air weapons in Scotland who will presumably want to obtain a licence. And yet all of those weapons, less the ones that will be surrendered during any amnesty period, are untraceable anyway, as air guns don't have a unique identification numbers, and I do think the Cabinet Secretary is right not to be going to try to bring in a system of giving them one. But the Law Society helpfully pointed out the difficulties of that situation, and I, I can only say good luck when this bill is passed with all of that, because it can only create a mountain of extra work and bureaucracy for an already overstretched police force with no measurable impact on air gun crime, and I therefore find myself asking, what is all this for? Well, I don't think it's about public, public benefit, despite Alex, Alex Rowley's very... Uh, co convincing in many ways arguments, and I'm afraid it didn't convince me, and I listened to them very carefully. Uh, tens of thousands of people will be caught up in a licensing scheme that will involve an incalculable number of inquiry officer visits to applicants' homes for purposes of verification, and an indicative cost of at least £85 per application. That's huge public expense is going to be incurred for no calculable close, public please. benefit. Or, or reduction in crime, all requiring a new regulatory infrastructure to be put in place to oversee the system. In conclusion, presiding officer, 
Uh, I don't think this section of the bill. I think this section of the bill targets the wrong people, because future offenders won't be those who have obtained a licence. It will do nothing to preserve public safety, as the Law Society points out in its submission, where it highlights the very real possibility that many of the untraceable air weapons in Scotland will simply disappear into the wrong hands as and when a licences scheme is introduced. And finally, Police Scotland's infrastructure is ill-equipped and under-resourced to deal with what it's asked. Presiding officer, the Cabinet Secretary strikes me as a very sensible man. I told him I would be nice about him. Um, he has seen sense on corrobor corroboration. I hold on to the hope that he can see sense on this as well. Thank you very much. I now call on Alex Rowley, a generous eight minutes. Thank you, President Officer. Um, in terms of winding up, can I, can I say that, first, I think there has been um, a lot of consensus, as there was in the committee around this bill, and there is, I think, in, in, in this chamber on, on all sides, um, a, a willingness to see this bill go forward and go through. And, and it's how we can work together, I hope, over the, the coming weeks. And I hope the, the Minister will give an indication he's summing up that, that he is willing to, to work um, with the different groups, with the different arguments that have been put forward today to try and find a way so that, that, that we can actually re contain, continue with that consensus as we move forward. The area the consensus broke down was, was obviously the, the Conservative Party and their view on the their weapons. And I would have to say that, that I, I don't agree. I think it was um, Elaine Murray who pointed out that, that in terms of the offences that were committed that, and over a period, the, the committee was advised the 84 offences. We've also seen um, representations being made for animal welfare organisations and for other organisations um, that highlight um, some, of the, some of the issues that can arise around air weapons. And the point that was made by Elaine Murray was that they are weapons at the end of the day. Um, so, so I certainly am supportive of that part of the, the bill and, and, and the Labour Party will certainly support that as we move forward. Um, John Wilson talked about the, 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 the fees and the committee picked that point up in, in terms of the, the, the full recovery, the cost recovery in terms of the, the air weapons. And I know that's a matter that, that still seems to sit with the UK government, but again, the committee have picked that up and, and, and talked about about being able to, to um, recover all the costs. Um, so, so I think it's important that, that the report itself, that, that we are able to pick those, those points up. The Minister has indicated that there are, and has um, replied to the report, that there are areas of the report that, that he's fairly positive about and will pick up some of the recommendations that's there. But I do hope we can have that discussion with the Minister over the coming weeks. Um, and because I think there are a number of recommendations that the committee have brought forward. Um, and when Kevin Stewart made his contribution, he made the point that all these people that have given up their time to, to give evidence to the committee, it would be good to be able to demonstrate that it's actually worthwhile taking the time and the trouble and giving evidence to this parliament and to be able to demonstrate that those issues are being picked up and taken on board. Um, so I do hope that we can pick some of these issues up. A number of the contributors also talked about the, the, um, the proposals in terms of licensing the, um, the clubs that, that, that the, the, bright how, the bright crew decision in terms, of, in terms of regulation in effect meant that for sexual entertainment venues there was no regulation and that is why I think even those who have contributed and said that in their opinion they would rather these clubs did not exist have welcomed the fact that we need some kind of regulation. And I think the point was made again by a number of the people who have contributed that actually um, local authorities um, are well placed to be able to make the decisions in terms of whether or not they believe that these venues um, should be licensed within the local authority area. And they, of course, are held to account by the electorate at the end of the day. And for those of us who support devolving decision-making to the, the lowest possible level, then 
such an important issue as this, um, I believe that it is right that local authorities would have that, that final say. But as a number of contributors, Cara Hilton um, and, and um, others have, have pointed out, there are still a number of issues that we would like to have a discussion with the Minister about. I congratulate Sandra White because I accept and I know that she has pushed this issue for some time. But on the questions of, of whether young people um, the age of 16 to 18 should be working in these venues, etc. And I know that, that there has been an argument put about employment law. But again, if the Minister is open to that discussion, then we can have that discussion around these issues and hopefully pick them up and take, take, take those issues forward. Willie Coffey talked again about the sharing the information between um, authorities, licensing authorities in terms of the taxi operators and it's something that Willie Coffey certainly I think asked a lot of questions about at the committee. The committee report itself um, page 55 does have a recommendation that there should be more discussion there. Again, whether that's something that needs to be brought up as an amendment at stage two, or whether the Minister is open to having that discussion and that dialogue, um, I would hope that, that he is, and we could pick that up and move that forward. Um, Claire Adamson talked about the importance of safety when, when looking at taxis and, and the point about taxi apps, but gave an example of somebody who was sexually assaulted by getting into a taxi that she thought was private hire. There was, I would have to say, an academic came, I think, from uh, Edinburgh University to the committee that was uh, certainly an expert on taxis, not just in Scotland, but across the world. And he did, I think, give the view that as this legislation came forward, it could be out of date. Um, as quickly as it comes forward because of new technologies and uh, it's an area that Willie Caulfield has, has, has more uh, Willie Coffey has, has more expertise in in terms of technology but it may be that that part of the bill will have to be looked at again in the future because there was a view that we were not yep I thank Mr Rowley for giving way, President Officer. I think one of the key things that we have got to secure throughout this is that folks know that they are going into a vehicle with a licensed driver uh, and uh, a licensed vehicle. I think that's the essential element in all of this, whether we move technological-wise and all of the rest in terms of hailing or apping or whatever it may be. The key thing to keep folks secure, I think, is to keep that licensed driver and that licensed vehicle elements in place. And I I think that we should do everything possible to ensure that that continues. Alex Riley, into your final minute now. Yeah, I would, I would, I would agree entirely with, with what Kevin Stewart has to say. And again, Cameron, Cameron Buchanan did raise that in his introduction that he, he wondered whether we were, we were being too heavily handed in terms of the licensing of taxis with the provision of, of um, the, 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 the um, taxis being treated in a similar way to the pri private hire. Um, but what I would say to that is the evidence did not suggest that. Those who came to the committee and gave evidence, both the taxi operators who operate private hire as well as the taxi association, all seem to be fairly positive and in favour of the legislation that was being proposed. I was struck by the, the sense of pride that the taxi operators took in terms of the quality, the quality of the training, the skills, the expertise that they would expect for their drivers to have. So there was, I would say, a broad welcoming of the, the proposals that were being brought forward. You so, close, so in conclusion, Rowley. presiding officer, there are a number of areas, particularly in the regulation of sexual uh, entertainment venues, where I think quite a number of members in here have said that there are a number of areas where they would like to look at amendments, and I would ask the, the Minister to give an indication that he's willing to meet, certainly with members who have those concerns and want to bring forward amendments and see if we can maintain the consensus that we've had in here today as we go forward to stage two and stage three and pass the legislation. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Ten minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I uh, first of all say um, I'm very grateful to all the members who have contributed in this debate and I've uh, listened very carefully to many of the comments and issues which have been raised with them. I also understand some of the frustration that members have in terms of the legislation, the way in which it is presented with several different component parts to that. 
Uh, not something which is unfamiliar and unusual uh, in Parliament. There are some parts of the uh, uh, particular piece of legislation which uh, would uh, which would be difficult to have as bills on their own, given that they are very limited in uh, nature. Uh, but I also uh, recognise that this is an opportunity to take forward a number of different things that were needing changed within other aspects of legislation, for example, around the Licensing Act uh, uh, 2005, uh, that this bill is give, acting as a vehicle in which to deliver. I think I'm also conscious of the point that Tavish Scott made. You know, um, he's been in this place as long as I have, and I don't think there is a parliamentary session that we go through where there is not some form of licensing legislation which is necessary uh, because of circumstances that develop, that we learn from, that we then have to go back and look at amending the legislation, introducing new regulations, and to respond to some of these challenges which they uh, come up. But I do think, uh, for example, the, um, the Alcohol Scotland Act uh, at 2005, uh, which uh, Tavish Scott made reference to, made a significant improvement in the way in which we uh, license uh, uh, premises that sell alcohol. One of the, for example, one of the very common issues uh, used to always be raised with myself by uh, the police were those who were um, uh, off licences where uh, they would be found uh, to be selling alcohol to those who were under 18 and they were at risk of losing their licence and they would simply actually transfer it into another family member uh, and the premises continued. By having a premises licence and individual licence, you're closing down that potential scope. So I think uh, the Licence in Scotland Act, uh, the Alcohol Licence in Scotland Act uh, uh, 2005 made a significant level of improvement in how we go about uh, our licensing uh, provision around alcohol. On the issue around the uh, uh, Civic Government Scotland Act uh, 1982, uh, and I, I said to the committee at the time, I understand the calls for a review of that piece of legislation. I also said to the committee that we should not underestimate the scale of that type of review and the potential work which would be involved in that. Uh, my estimation is that it would take several years for that type of work to be undertaken uh, in order to take it forward. So I recognise and understand the calls for a review, but what I would uh, caution uh, members on is the potential implications of that and the nature of work that would be involved in it. And as I said to the committee, I'd be more than happy to come back to the committee in the autumn, having looked at that issue in greater detail. Give way to Mr Wilson. Wilson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. One of the issues that came up at the committee, Cabinet Secretary, was how the 1982 legislation was being applied throughout Scotland and so what appeared to be inconsistencies in relation to the application of the 1982 uh, legislation by certain local authorities. And it would just be useful to get an indication from the Cabinet Secretary whether or not he could look at some of the inconsistencies that were identified when we took evidence. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Senator Robson, I'm always uh, prepared to look at areas where things can be improved, but by licensing in its very nature, there will always be a level of variation because of the way in which uh, individual local authorities uh, take particular matters forward. Uh, but I'm always uh, more than happy. And can I say to uh, Alex Rowley and his uh, point around uh, uh, having a discussion around some of the areas that he has raised and his colleagues have raised uh, where they believe that the uh, bill can be improved. Uh, you know, my position in this is that um, I'm not in favour of deleting any sections of the bill, which will disappoint uh, the Conservatives, but I'm always open to looking at how we can improve the legislation at whichever side of the chamber they come from. So I'm more than happy to engage with Alec Rowley and his colleagues and any other members in the chamber uh, to look at how we can improve this particular piece of uh, legislation. Can I turn to the issue around the uh, uh, licensing of air weapons? And I note the position that the Conservative Party have now uh, taken uh, on this matter. I think it's important to recognise um, uh, that it is, it's positive that the number of uh, crimes which have involved a uh, firearm uh, over uh, recent years has decreased and has decreased significantly. Having said that, almost half of all of the incidents that do involve a firearm involve an air weapon. So they are, they continue, although that number has been dropping, they are almost half of all of the incidents that involve an, a, a weapon, a, 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 a weapon of a, 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 of a firearm nature involve involve a, a, an air weapon. And the approach that we have sought to take in this area is a way in which it's to try and act in a proportionate way. So the way in which the licensing regime will operate for air weapons is not the same in the way in which it will operate for firearms and for shotguns. It is a much lighter touch, but it allows the police, as the police have said, to be able to prevent an individual from having 
an air weapon if they do not believe they are a suitable individual to have one or they do not think they would be using it in an appropriate way as well, which has been a frustration to the police for some time, where there are individuals who they do not believe should actually have an air weapon, who have been able to have one, and they have been powerless to do anything about it, a point that was raised by Sandra White in her own contribution. I will give way to Mr Ferguson. Alex Ferguson. Okay, we have Mr Ferguson's mic on, please. Mike Heldon, Mr Ferguson has his <laughs> I thought you would have known better, Mr Ferguson. <laughs> so would I, presiding officer. You're absolutely right. I apologise. Um, I, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary is open to the possible suggestion, perhaps at a later stage in the bill, that if somebody already holds a shotgun or a firearm certificate, they would automatically have the right to possess an air gun. Well, part of the provision we've put in the bill is for those who actually hold a shotgun or a firearms licence, that they will not have, they also have an air weapon, they will not have to apply for a uh, near weapons licence until they are applying for their new shotgun or firearms weapon uh, licence when it expires. So that's the only point they would actually have to apply for it during that particular process. And that is to take away some of that potential burden from them as well. I can also turn to this issue that Mr Ferguson raised around the, uh, the, the burden that this will potentially place on the police and having to uh, conduct all of the uh, licences that will be required for these uh, uh, air weapons. Uh, as the member may be aware, there are very significant peaks and troughs in the way in which the police deal with uh, firearms licensing, a point that was made by uh, John Wilson in his own contribution. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that the way we introduce the provision around air weapons is in that trough when they are not dealing with any significant amounts of firearms or shotgun licences. And that's the work we're taking forward with the police. And as I've indicated, we're looking at how we can take that through secondary legislation in order to manage that issue as well. Can I also point out as well that the uh, licences for, uh, you call it, the fees for uh, both shotguns and firearms has actually increased from £50. It increased as of the 6th of April. Uh, for a firearms, it's now £88. And for a shotgun certificate, it's now £79.50. But I do believe that we have sought to try and achieve a balance on the whole issue around the licensing of uh, air weapons, and I believe that the bill is reflective of that. Can I turn now to the issue around, uh, particularly given the number of comments that have been made around uh, sexual entertainment uh, venues? Again, I understand the comments and concerns that have been raised by uh, some members on this particular issue and the need to provide uh, licensing provisions in this matter. And Sandra White, I know, has pursued this matter for almost a decade now. Uh, through this Parliament. And to her credit, we are now making significant progress in this bill in addressing the issues of concern uh, which she has uh, raised. Uh, I'm very conscious that so often when government takes forward action, uh, there is the accusation that we are taking powers to the centre, making decisions that should have been allowed to be taken at a local level. And in this bill, we are allowing local licensing boards to make that decision based on local policy. That local policy, and the point that was raised by Rhoda Grant, is that if they wish to set a zero figure for those types of sexual entertainment venues, they can do so. There is a process that they will have to go through in the justification of that, but allows them the opportunity to do that should they wish to do. So it gives them the power and it allows them to then engage with their local community and to reflect on that in the decision making which they make at a localised level. And I believe that's the right balance to strike on this matter. Uh, and it gives them the power and the scope to be able to take that forward. On the issue around under 18s being able to work in these venues when they're not operating, I'm more than open to looking at where there are measures that can be taken there. I'm very conscious, though, that there are some issues around employment law, uh, which we have to be careful of, but I'm more than happy to look at that uh, further. And also on the issue about the working conditions for those in then, again, I'm more than happy to look at where there are provisions that could be put probably in secondary legislation uh, for licensing boards to take into account these matters um, as well. If so you that bring in remarks to close. That would help to sign off. So that would help to improve the legislation. So I'm open uh, to look at how we can take these forward as well. Sign officer, it's been a very useful debate. We'll consider all of the points that have been raised, and I will respond to members in as positive a way I can in order to build on this legislation to improve it, to make it as suitable as possible, and to make sure that we continue to have a range of licensing regimes in Scotland that are fit for purpose. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the Air Weapons and Licence in Scotland Bill. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 12488 in the name of Don Swinney on the financial resolution for the Air Weapons and Licence in Scotland Bill. 
and I call on Michael Matheson to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 12994 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Air Weapons and Licence in Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12994 in the name of Michael Matheson is as follows. Yes, 60. No, 0. There were 12 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12488 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Air Weapons and Licence in Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting. <laughs>